And we are live. Welcome to the Startup Tank. If this is your first time, this is the Startup Tank. I'm your host, Matt Ward, founder and partner at Forward VC's Climate Syndicate, where we invest in early stage, pre-seed and seed stage climate companies around the world, like some of the ones maybe you'll be seeing here today. The Startup Tank, what do we do? There's Shark Tank, there's Dragon's Den. They've managed to build up great audiences, great businesses, and uh, destroy the world in the process in certain ways. Well, we uh, at the Startup Tank, we're focused on climate impact companies, companies that are making the world a better place and really doing that through both business and impact. These companies, when they grow in scale, we have a better world. And that's why they're here. Alongside myself with Forward VC, we'll also have two other uh, panelists on the program, Jake with Vala Capital and Brian with AGN Asset Management. If you could saw the event, you may have been expecting lower carbon capital. We had a we had a little bit of a an accident at the end with a, a delayed flight, but we got incredible investors here either way. So the format of the startup tank, how it works, we select and pre-screen the top climate companies out there. They come to us, they get five minutes to pitch in front of our esteemed panel of investors. And then no investments are actually happening here. None of this is financial advice. Nothing is being solicited. We're merely showing these companies. If you want to learn more about us and what we do at Forward VC and our climate syndicate of accredited investors, you can check us out at Forward, so the number forward.vc, and find more details there. And before I hand things over to our other investor panelists and then get things off to bat, I want to thank um, Valbon by Carta. They're sponsoring all of season two, which we're incredibly excited about. We use Valbon when we set up our SPVs, and we just did a very, very interesting Israeli battery tech company. We've got a couple more that we've got in the pipeline and should have more details for you guys soon. Just getting the, the last checks in. We invest in sci-fi type companies that make the world better by making tangible, large, real-world impact. But this isn't just about me. This is about the startups. This is about the, the investors. This is about everyone in the community. So I want to bring in our other investors for tonight. We've got Brian Wayne with AGN Asset Management and Jake Womb Wom Wombwell Povey. I always have to get at least one of the names wrong. So Jake, tonight it's your turn. And I'm going to- That was I'm close gonna... enough. It's close enough. Thanks for being such a last minute uh, jump in, Jake, and helping out here. Do you want to tell people a little bit more about you and Vela Capital, and then we'll hand things over to Brian? Yeah, sure. So I'm a partner of Vela Capital. We're based in London. We're a pre-seed and seed stage venture firm investing across the UK and Europe. We've done a couple overseas out of the family office that sits alongside us, but we're principally kind of European focused. Um, personally, I'm, I invest North America, Europe, and Israel. We typically look at uh, a number of verticals, uh, specifically in sustainable consumption and technology for planetary health. And as a firm, we're very much founder-led. You know, we're built by founders. Most of the partners are founders. So we pride ourselves in getting into the kind of cockpit with founders, trying to support them along the way, provide them that founder empathy. And I know we're not unique in that, but it's certainly the approach that we think enables us to have a, the most fun along the way. And hopefully our investing companies feel the same. And fun's a, fun's a huge factor there. And Brian, do you want to share a little bit more about Aegean and what you guys do? Um, sure. So it's actually, it's Aegon. Aegon, uh, I apologize. Yeah, if, if people were watching, watch Game of Thrones or anything, that's an easy association. Um, but Aegon's been around for, for a very long time. We're a global investment manager uh, based out of the Netherlands. I operate out of the US. Um, we, um, you know, we're a global investment manager, public and private markets, uh, a number a number of things for, for our clients. Um, a big focus overarching the organization is, is responsible investment. Um, within, I co-founded uh, a business called Impact Venture Credit, um, which focuses on uh, multi-stage uh, investment. So early through growth stage across the capital stack in different ways on uh, providing different types of investments, either it be debt or converts or others um, into companies that focus exclusively where um, they're climate driven uh, type of company. So uh, we are within the climate space. We're pretty agnostic sector wise, but it's a wide scope. But think 
um, things around energy management solutions and systems, the built environment, advanced materials, food and agriculture, it all fits within our thesis. And for our thesis that Forward VC, we do Europe, North America, and Israel primarily. I like to tell founders we won't be the biggest check, but we will be the biggest hustler at the table. And you can see a little bit of that from our uh, our VC database. If you guys go to forward.vc slash VC database, we've got a database of eight or 900 funds and incubators, accelerators in the climate and clean tech space I've been connecting with over the past, uh, since I've gotten into this to be able to really help founders. We focus on hard real world problems, food, ag tech, energy, transportation, construction, anything that's not super sexy, we find sexy. We like to get into that and decarbonize. And this is now time to turn things over to our awesome company. So that was a little bit of an overview of the startup tank. If you want to learn more about us or apply to pitch, we do this every two weeks. Next session is the 24th of October, the startuptank.com for more details and to apply and make sure you hit that subscribe bell on YouTube or wherever you're watching. We're on all the major podcasting platforms. And now we're going to turn things over to the really uh, the really core of the night, and that's the companies. So companies, um, for everyone, if this is your first time, the companies left five minutes to pitch our shark panel of climate investors, and then followed by about 10 minutes of Q&A. At the end of the night, we'll choose a startup of the night, and they will be crowned to the champion. We would love to have some prizes. So if anyone's watching this and wants to offer prizes to the startups, we're in the, we're in the process of setting up some of those partnerships now. But now, without further ado, I want to hand things over to Chris with Pipe Predict. Really interesting company I met through a, a contact at Uber Morgan, who we're a big fans of. And they are uh, they're big on water, saving water specifically. Chris, you want to take things away? Just uh, sharing my slides and hope it works out. Can everybody see the slides already? It looks good. And your five minutes starts now. Perfect. Thanks, Matt, for the introduction. As you said, I'm Chris, one of the co-founders of Pipe Predict. And we enable reliable and sustainable supply through pipe networks. It sounds a little bit abstract. So for a practical example, just imagine you wake up one morning, you have a super important appointment that day. So you want to go there by car. You just leave your house and then you see this. This was actually caused by a pipe burst in Berlin a few years ago. But nowadays, no one can really be sure not to be affected by a pipe burst because they're kind of like ticking time bombs below Earth where no one knows when and where the next one is going to burst. That's simply because pipes are buried below earth, so no one can see the current leakage status, and pipe bursts happen without prior notice. And with this way, utilities worldwide lose water worth 173 billion euros each year. Um, but as we found out in pilot projects, not only utilities have problems with leakages and bad knowledge about their pipe networks, but also other industries which are using pipes to transport media. So for example, district heating companies, oil and gas pipelines, and the chemical and pharmaceutical industry. And what utilities or these companies are doing to solve that problem is in most of the times actually this. They wait for the pipe to burst, only then to repair it as fast as possible. Or if they cannot afford having bursts and uh, a lot of leakages, they do rehabilitation strategies and a lot of inspections and spend a lot of money on that. So utilities have to wait until they see the leak then start emergency repairs, which are of course quite um, yeah, expensive and time intense. And this way utilities worldwide lose up to 50% of their distributed water. 50%, that sounds in, in, insane for us. So we came up uh, with an idea. We came up with a digital solution which can be implemented into already existing pipe networks. Therefore, we first of all need pipes, of course, to monitor them, but we also integrate already existing pipe, uh, sensors from within the pipe network from different manufacturers and different types of sensors. So for example, pressure sensors, flow rate sensors, and acoustic sensors. And those sensor data is being transmitted using newest signal transmission technologies like LoRaWAN or narrowband IoT. This is necessary for us because we are focusing on analyzing the data. And for that, we create a digital twin of the pipes network, which is kind of a 3D model of the real pipes network, but with all the physical properties in the background. So for example, the age of the pipe, the diameter, um, the material consists of where which kind of sensor is placed and how the network is meshed, and so on. Kind of a connection between physical world and sensor data world. And with this connection, we can analyze the existing sensor data with our self-developed algorithms. This is a supervised machine learning algorithm, but also some physical algorithms, which help us to monitor the network in real time and also send out alerts in real time if there's something changing in the network. 
We then localize leakages very precisely down to three to five meters. And in future, we also predict when and where pipes are going to burst. All of this helps our customer to reduce costs for repairment processes, for reducing losses, and also for digging up less street because we're finding the leakages very precisely. And we enable planability um, so that limited resources like material, budget, and labor um, can be planned in an optimized way. And this is very, uh, also very interesting for industry parks because they have to plan three to six months ahead. Also, we increase resource efficiency, that's why we're here, and uh, increase sustainability. Our saving potential is more than 250 megatons of carbon dioxide per year, according with water and district heating pipelines only. And with our real-time monitoring and predictive maintenance, we um, yeah, help that there are no more emergency repairs and no production stops in industry parks. But why is now the right timing? So pipes in the network um, have been aging for yeah at least since... Uh, yeah, for a lot of time. And uh, in Germany, since World War II, there were a lot of pipes replaced and they're lasting normally 60 to 80 years. So there's a need one minute for... warning. Yep, there is a need. Um, pipes are aging uh, and they need to be replaced. But according to statistics, um, everything needs to be replaced and utilities need to know which pipes to replace first. And cultural and social trends like uh, urbanization, population growth and climate change and like just make a bigger make the problem bigger but the good answer is um, utilities and um, uh, public funds have known about that problem and are uh, giving some money for that and the even better knowledge, uh, news is that now the technology is available with smart sensors with signal transmission and with our solution for analyzing sensor data so we built up a right team for um, getting that problem solved we have an international inter interdisciplinary team which covers all of the necessary needs currently supported by six employees and an advisory board, as Mets are, for example, from Übermorgen. So if you're also interested in um, yeah, decarbonizing pipe networks and, and helping to have a reliable and sustainable supply through pipe networks, just join our vision. Perfect. Happy to answer your questions now. Perfect. Let me bring back our other investor panelists. And then uh, I would hand things over first to Brian. What questions do you have for... Uh, for uh, Chris about uh, Pipe Predict. Sure. How you doing, Chris? Thanks. Hi. Thanks for the presentation. Um, so, um, just so just so I understand on um, how this compares to the current solution I saw in the slide, um, has their sensors and other things that are transmitted to the operators of whatever project or. Um, things that they, they own the, the piping system that's in place. So with yours, with the digital twin um, version of this, this is to essentially provide another layer of analytics that shows like what's, what's, where do you see the biggest compelling avenue on the digital twin piece, which I see is what is one of the, the value at big value add factors of what I see on, on your platform. Mm -hmm. Good question. So the digital twin helps us to um, yeah, have an easy and scalable solution for not having being able or not having to um, create a hydraulic model of the pipe network because that's the current approach or the normal approach to generate a hydraulic model, which is quite very time intense and a lot of maths you have to do. Um, only then you can insert the existing sensors um, into the network and analyze them. And our solution, like our digital twin, can be automized and can uh, automatically also be created using already existing geoinformation data. So we use that as a connection between the physical world and the sensor data world in order to analyze the sensor data. Otherwise, you would have to build uh, very intense models um, in order to analyze that data. And so just, uh, just a quick follow-up to, to that question. Are you then integrating with the sensor information that you have with those particular partners and is there standardized sensor mechanisms for various pipes or are there all different companies with different types of sensors and things that you need to adapt to and develop new software to adhere to, to um, you know, the different types of sensors, different types of pipes? I'm, I'm sure there's a plethora of them. There's a lot of uh, sensors within the networks, yes. Um... Utilities install whatever they have and whatever they find best. And over also over the years, what was technology leader, um, we have no problem to integrate all of these existing data. Um, if they are already transferred to the utility, we can just use a RESTful API in order to integrate that data um, and to analyze them then. 
And um, we, of course, look first of all in the network what kind of sensors already in place and what precision would be able with our analytics in order to yeah, find leakages and detect them. Um, and afterwards, we get back to the utility and ask them if the precision is necessary or how precise the um, precision is necessary um, and what additional sensor would be necessary in the pipe networks in order to get to that precision. But we also optimize that in order to not install a lot of sensors, but use existing access points and have, thus have fused investments on sensor, but getting the highest data quality, which we need to uh, find the leakages. Uh, I'll, I'll pass it off to Jake or, Jake or Matt. I have lots of questions, but I don't want to, I don't want to just take up time. I'm trying to be cognizant of, of, of the format here. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, so I've got um, two questions, really. First is just what's your current traction? Our current traction regarding customers is that we um, have installed or we have implemented one solution for a customer um, already last year with Engie, which is an energy uh, supplier from France. And we have converted them into monthly paying customer through that project. And uh, since then, we have started eight new projects and also plan to convert them into monthly paying customers. In each project, we um, already sell six months of um, analyzing sensor data and then transform them to monthly paying customers. So we have uh, projects in district heating, in water networks, and in industry parks. Cool. Okay. So you you sell them six months. Is that like a six month free trial? No. So no. you're saying and in... that's paid also. Okay. So six month kind of discrete trial, and then you move them on to recurring exactly. revenue, right? Yeah. And the one well, a challenge from selling into this space is clearly utility companies are not famous for being agile and nimble. So the sales cycle can take a long period of time, as can, you know, obviously deploying, not, not deploying your technology, but more, for example, providing water or waste to a hospital or something like that is quite an important strategic regulated uh, utility. So I'm curious what your current estimate is, bearing in mind your traction of your sales cycle is and what your thoughts are around how you might be able to accelerate that over time. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, we actually really see that in the uh, area. So we have planned three to uh, six to uh, 12 months of sales cycles in order to get the customers on board. Um, of course, it takes a little bit of time until they are on board, but also the space is very uh, well connected. So one utility is telling the other one what's working well. So within this utility, if we have proven our concept, they will spread the word. Uh, and that's a good uh, approach for that uh, for that. Um, yeah, area of application. And also another point is that um, these utilities mostly, or big utilities, mostly not provide only one network, but uh, several networks. For example, NG, our first customer, has uh, 45 networks in France and more than 200 networks worldwide. So of course, we also try to sell up within the customer. And that gives us uh, yeah, a lot of traction. Yeah. So is it safe to say your current focus is European or Northern European utilities? That's right, yeah. Yeah. And European, I would say. Would you mind just talking around the thinking of moving away from just say one type of network, say water, and into say things like water and district heating? Because I appreciate with a data driven technology like yours, there is some value in having a really deep data lake. So obviously, the more, and then that, that will obviously come in time, regardless of which application you're in or which type of network but just curious as to why you're kind of splitting that lake to start with across different types of network rather than just majoring on say water or district heating etc yeah good point uh, we first of all our vision is to re reduce losses and energy losses or media losses and energy losses in all kind of pipes which are transporting mm -hmm. a medium like a liquid or a gas uh, under pressure so that's why we also um, have the different markets like chemicals and production and oil and gas pipelines on the on the on our pipeline development pipeline yeah. but we have started with utilities because it has the biggest um, climate impact and also with energy networks because they were yeah in a really need of a solution there's no digital solution currently to retrofit uh, in the existing pipe networks to monitor them so they were really eager to yeah, have a, a monitoring in their pipe networks. That's why we started with them. But as we found out also with the chemical or production companies, they're also very interested in reducing losses. That's why we also had 
already two pilot projects or we are currently having two pilot projects in the industry parks. So pull, just pulling on that thread a little bit, a little bit more, I, I agree with Jake on saying, you know, having concentrated focus in a certain area, really to have a number of analytics that you can then in turn show to a utility or other entity and say like, here's the proof point. So what can you briefly describe what the selling process is to them, given where you are, where your stage and perhaps, you know, don't have a, a robust amount of analytics to show like here's proof cases, because this is almost like a, a liability type of insurance piece that goes like an OPEX type of thing to ensure that you're not, so you're mitigating losses instead of more uh, of something for growth, it's, you know, to protect bottom line for, uh, you know, different entities. So can you describe just real briefly how you interact the set, like with the sales process? Mm -hmm. um, so for, for networks uh, to get that right, water networks are transporting water, but also district heating networks are using water to transport the energy and also in industry parks, these are liquids. So we're basically gathering the rate, the same information um, and we are using different types of sensor data, for example, pressure um, data and acoustic data, where we have um, already pre-trained um, pre models in order to find anomalies within these networks and within the patterns of the acoustic data or the pressure data. So um, that's how we focus on like one specific topic on pipes. But of course, the, the market is bigger than that. Um, oil and gas pipelines are in the future and gas pipelines um, still need to be developed by ourselves. But um, yeah, we are focusing first on that. But does that answer the question or am I going in the wrong direction? Yeah, I, I, I guess maybe there wasn't, there wasn't a definitive answer at like the stage and where you guys are in your life cycle. Obviously, there's a powerful thing of anecdotal evidence of showing how this is, you know, saved X amount of dollars due to being upfront about a potential problem and show it through a couple, you know, customers and, and those things. And that certainly will take time to get to get to that point. Um, Matt, how, how are we doing on, on time? I just. I... Yeah, I would say I would say um, I would forego my questions on this one and then move things over to the next startup. And then uh, for people that want to connect with Chris, it, it's pretty easy to find out at uh, his email address and if not um you can post your email in the in the chat in linkedin or here on uh, youtube or i think it was also Zoom. on the slides but yeah oh perfect yeah and uh if anyone wants to get in touch with chris then you guys know where to do that and thanks chris for presenting i want to i want to i want to transition now to our next company because we've got six pretty incredible ones we started in the water so let's let's keep things in the water and how about we hand it over to Paige with Nike, Nyoka, it's a little hard on the pronunciation, but very cool on, very cool on the <laughs> so technology, close, so close. Nyoka, do you want to take things away, Paige, and uh, shine a light on what you guys are doing, so to speak? Absolutely, thank you, Matt, that was a great pun for the intro, I love it. <laughs> great pun, tell me when you're ready. All right, can you see my screen here? We got your screen, your five minutes starts now, let's roll. All right, thank you. So my name is Paige. I am the co-founder and CEO of Nyoka, and we're bringing you light from the future. So there is a toxic chemical industry known as chemiluminescence or chemical light. And that's what we're focused on um, as the problem we're solving. So all these chemicals are derived from petrochemicals and are a great contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. And the waste from them is hazardous and carcinogenic. We estimate at least 1.5 million tons of this waste enters our environment every single year. And this is a $9 billion problem. Um, industries that currently rely on this chemical light for the performance of it are searching for safe and sustainable alternatives. So we're focused on an application that can range from marine, um, where they're used as chemical fishing lures, diagnostics for use in lab assays, safety, military, and consumer. Uh, you may recognize chem lights, um, also in aerospace and many more industries. Uh, these chemicals are used worldwide. And we are focused on developing a solution that completely eradicate the use of these chemicals. So at Nyoka, we engineer proteins to produce safe, sustainable, and efficient light. It's based on the phenomena of bioluminescence. 
Uh, with our technology, this will enable us to expand the current market and also create new applications that have never been possible before because the current chemical light is so toxic and um, corrosive to handle. Uh, so with Myoka, um, we're making sure that we have strong advantages across all aspects of the business. So we're technically like last movers in the field of chemiluminescence. We really understand the market, what performance specs are required, how it's used across all these industries, but we are first movers and leaders in the field of this protein engineering. All of our work is patented. We've had um, one patent fully issued to this point and over six patent families supporting our work in this, in this area. And then all, everything else that is not patented, we guard closely as trade secrets, such as our custom formulations. The uh, end product itself is very difficult to copy. Um, you can't really tell what's in there. And it's and again, it's our um, custom proteins that actually create that reaction. And uh, there's barriers to reverse engineering um, where a lot of the innovation is also in the manufacturing processes to produce such a, a product at a cost-effective scale. And this is how we are moving forward in terms of tackling our first market and getting to the point where we're making 75 million in annual revenue. So our, there's a beachhead market of over 600 million. Um, this is based on chemical fishing lures where commercial fishing companies will attach a lure directly beside a hook to attract fish to that. So it's an essential part of their operations. We estimate between one and 2.7 billion commercial fishing lures are used every single year worldwide. Uh, we're focusing in on companies that have top of the line sustainability certification uh, from the Marine Stewardship Council. And this is a, a global a body. And just this July, they implemented a new requirement that all of their vessels adopt biodegradable fishing gear wherever possible. So just with this target market, um, the average annual order per boat is about 15,000, um, which would be about 50,000 lures. There's 5,000 boats that are sustain sustainably certified. So we have a near captive market that will bring us to 75 million in annual revenue um, in this target. And this is what we have created. So it's a biodegradable and non-toxic fishing lure that currently is over six times uh, longer lasting than current chemical lures. Um, it activates the second that we drop it into water. Um, it absorbs the ocean water to light up. We have a 600 meter depth rating, which is three times greater than current lures. Eliminates ghost gear, which is a uh, you know plastic waste that is lost. One minute acid. warning. Thank you. And um, yeah, no toxic chemicals. Uh, so I'll go quickly through this, but we have a better product. Uh, we're selling it at the same price, is, and we're, we'll retain eighty percent margins um, compared to the current lures that are currently used. And this just speaks to market trends across the world, uh, banning ghost gears, banning single-use plastics, and banning the use of toxic chemicals, specifically those that have carcinogenic impacts. Uh, this is the team behind it. Uh, so I talked about myself. I'm joined by Dr. Nick McGregor. He's working in the lab on the protein engineering. My co-founder, Daniel, has a bioprocess engineering background, getting us to scale. And Chip McCrimmon, previous startup founder, is running our go-to-market. Uh, so we've currently raised over 1 million in dilutive and non-dilutive to invest in product developments and protein engineering in our lab. Brought us to this year where we're raising 750K, um, which will launch our product manufacturing scale up, enabling us to really get into uh, some revenue production next year. And time is up. Perfect. Right, thank you. And this I mean is some of the pilots we've done to date, so... We'd love to hear more while we're getting the other investors on board, what those pilots look like, especially with NASA and Stellantis. Yes. So probably some of the best days of my life were when they emailed me. Um, so NASA, they were looking at reducing the use of chemiluminescence in some of their lab um, assays for the microfluidic devices. Uh, so we have ongoing pilots with them. And with Stellantis, they got in touch looking for emergency car lighting that would work uh, when all electric systems failed. So it just speaks to the broad array of applications well beyond what we currently know. Um, again, it's, it's longer of a process to get something like that fully to market. So we're focused on applications that we know and that there's a great need for and customer understanding while we do more ongoing work with larger uh, potential clients on novel applications. So speaking of my first question before I hand things over would be focus. There are a lot of applications. How do you decide where to attack first and how do you decide when and if to expand? It was difficult, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that. Um, and really how we've, we've thought about it is investing in our production and scale up 
um, will help us with all the different applications that are possible because the core technology is the same, which is this protein um, formula. And then in terms of what we invest in our scalable sales process, that's where we're focused our sales team on the commercial fishing industry. Um, the government of Australia launched this huge report on the issues of these chemical lures. So there's a great kind of call in the market for something that like what we've created uh, with a biodegradable and non-toxic lure. Um, so there's a huge market need, which is what we're tackling with, with our um, you know, first go to market. And then beyond that, we're looking to move more into safety and naval applications using the commercial fishing industry as a stepping stone. Understood, understood. Then I would hand things over. Brian, you want to go first this time? Um, sure. Um, quite interesting. Um, can, you, can you tell me about the, so the, obviously you said it's trade secret, it's protein uh, based chemical, the compound that, that you have developed. Um, and you mentioned that you are late to the game, meaning it's been very much studied and other things. So you, were you specifying on this protein type of synthesis or? That was a Peter Thiel reference, I think. You want to be it the was. last one to <laughs> last one to last one to create something and you want to be the one to own it forever. Exactly. So um last mover, it's really so there's this whole market, um, this nine billion dollar market of chemiluminescence. Um, innovation has really stopped. The the last, um, you know, there aren't even any companies that are currently developing chemiluminescence. It's really owned by manufacturers and distributors at this point. Um, so with what we've developed at Nyoka, which is a biochemical lighting um, that is, you know, mod modulated by this protein that we're engineering, um, that's what we're moving forward as our, our secret sauce. You know, we we've patented it. And we'll be able to patent continuous uh, development because, again, it's a field that no one has moved into before. But in terms of us as a startup, um, the barrier to get people to buy it is much lower because they understand how it works. They understand what the benefits are um, in terms of our value prop, in terms of using a liquid light um, that has you know, no heat signature, is non-flammable, um, activates on demand. Um, it, it works the, almost the same as what's currently in the market, which is the chemiluminescence. So um, it puts us in a great position to understand where to go first. Yeah, and just on, on that, on the, the comparison to what is currently in the marketplace is, I guess one of the things is, uh, I guess the, the luminescence and brightness and the longevity of that product. So if you have something, you showed a picture of like some in the bag that are in C-bar, um, are those equivalent to what is in the market? I, uh, I presume it's all different kind of scales on on both of those factors, but how, how does this stack up to what is currently utilized? Yeah, currently we're um, kind of massively outperforming current chemiluminescence. So current chemical lures, they have a brightness between five to eight hours that is useful. Um, our product currently um, has that level of brightness for 48 hours. Um, because it's a protein-based catalyst, it's very stable. Um, so we can, we can really use that to our advantage. Um, we think we could get one to last, you know, beyond a week. If people will pay for something that lasts for a week, you know, we really want to see if that's useful to our, to our, our um, you know, customers before we um, launch that as a product. But right now it puts us in a great position where we can really tune the performance to what's needed instead of being limited, um, you know, to what is kind of currently known or, or having a product that doesn't, you know, act, um, perform as well. Yeah, yeah, super interesting. Uh, Jake, I'm yeah, although I've done my job and people buy it because of the performance and then the sustainability benefits are kind of, you know, our, our happy place. But um, that's been a huge focus of the company is I want people to buy this just because it works better than anything else. Um, and that's really a benefit of the, the uh, biotechnology that we're developing. Thanks, Paige. That was really interesting. Seth, thank you for pulling all that together and sharing that with us. My question is building on what you just mentioned there and the sustainability um, metrics and impacts. It's one of those where you, when taken in abstract, it's really clear, you know, non-recyclable toxic fishing lures sounds bad. This is better. That is good. But I'd love to just understand a little bit more on the metrics in that so that we can understand kind of pound for pound, dollar for dollar, you know, how mm. does this stack up? Yeah, so you know, we estimate that there's, again, like 1.5 million tons of waste that's produced just by the products of this industry. 
um, that enter our oceans. And so that is both, um, so that's the, the chemicals inside. And one of the things that is not widely known or regulated is that, so the, the chemicals that come in these lures um, before they're activated aren't that dangerous, but it's when they're actually mixed and after they're activated that these genotoxic compounds form. Um, and so that's when they become very dangerous. And also I'll say a problem with these lures is that between 100 and 200 feet uh, below the sea surface, they actually crack and, and release these compounds into the ocean. So it's a huge problem. And so what we've done with, with Nyoka, it follows all um, strategies of green chemistry, which is this kind of whole, um, you know, not super well-known side of, of um, chemistry, but it's this growing field where we're using a, a biodegradable catalyst is, is the main function of this protein. Um, and so what that means is that instead of needing very reactive chemicals to create this light, uh, the light is created when a chemical bond is broken and releases that energy. Um, so instead of needing reactive chemistry to kind of force that to happen, we use that protein to catalyze the reaction via a physical process where it basically stretches the molecule that, that then breaks and creates the light. And the benefit of using a protein is that it's entirely biodegradable. It biodegrades into simple amino acids, you know, um, same thing that like we're all made up of. So in terms of the chemistry itself, it's completely you know innocuous, non-toxic. And then the plastic that we're um, preventing from being used, we use an entirely um, plant-based uh, marine certified biodegradable shell. So we're really solving it from both angles on the toxic waste and also on the, the plastic as well. Our lower will biodegrade in the ocean at about the same time as an apple core, um, which is about three to six months. Cool. Is, is that yeah, for, the, for the pack, the container that it's in, um, what, what you're using, is that so are you, is it, a, is it a premium for that type of material um, currently? Because you said you're, going, you're being cost competitive with what's in the market and I presume they're at scale. And so, and they're also using something that, you know, is like virgin plastic molding to, to put it in there, which is incredibly yeah. cheap. So is there, is there a point of when you can get to like cost parity with this, with what's out there? Cause you know, in many cases, plastic is hard to compete with um, as, as that for, for its usage. Oh, I, I know. <laughs> That's one yeah. of the, another reason that we really focused on this marine application, um, because we're able to use a material that's widely known. And we also don't need very much material um, because we're not shipping it with um, any liquid reagent inside. We actually ship it dry. And so we're using the benefit of the ocean to, to give us kind of the water that we need to activate it. So we don't need a lot of material to, to host it. And we don't need a blend, you know, to make sure it doesn't biodegrade when there's liquid inside. Um, so we don't use very much material for the casing. And then also the um, protein-based reaction is extremely efficient. So we don't need nearly the, num the same number of, or the same quantity of reagents as the chemical lures. Um, we use, you know, milligrams, whereas they use, you know, 10 to like 20 grams of chemicals per lure. So there's a number of um, efficiency benefits that we get with our system as well. Um, current lures, we know um, the average wholesale price when people buy you know, 50,000 to a million are about 30 cents per, per lure. Um, even at our, our next stage of scale up is when we'll be able to do batches of 100,000 to a million um, with our manufacturing process. And based on, you know, quotes that we've gotten from, from a range of manufacturers, our cost of goods on that product will be about six cents. So we have a, a great profit margin, even if we're selling, you know, at the exact same price. Um, we are gonna be working to develop our pricing strategy um, to you know, make sure that we're, we're doing that properly, but at a very simple level, um, we'll still be able to sell at the same price, have a healthy profit margin um, at our next stage of scaling up. Currently, that's our biggest limiting factor and why I'm fund tracing. Uh, we currently grow our protein in a jar about, about this big, um, and we're, we're going to be scaling up to be um, fermenting it in about a, a 2,000 liter bioreactor. Great, I appreciate all that background. And then how do you sell it? What's the, what's the big go to market? How do you access these type of customers and what's the sales cycle look like? Yeah. So, um, you know, it's a very kind of personable market. Um, a lot of these, um, you know, companies have been in business for a very long time or are family owned. Um, and what we've really seen is, is care deeply about the ocean. 
Um, and that's another reason why we're focusing our, our first target on companies and vessels that are already sustainably certified. Um, this, this certifying body also recommends products, um, recommends new innovation, and again, has just implemented this requirement that they that they use biodegradable equipment wherever possible by 2025. So what we've started to do is we have a number of marine partners um, lined up as our pilots uh, pilot partners. We actually had a pilot run this September with B&G Fishing down in New Zealand. Um, we have two other partners that form our, our customer intent, which is over 500,000 um, for our lures, and they usually buy them. Um, usually once a year as a bulk of what they'll need for the entire year. So it's a, it's a great sales cycle for us because what we're looking to do is because at the beginning we will have more limited supply than our competitors, um, but we have a product that people are really excited about. We'll be able um, to you know, get people signed on to multi-year contracts um, where then we can really um, commit to providing them the number of lures you know, ahead of time and, and they'll be kind of on our list in terms of who we'll be selling to. So that's that's a strategy that we'll likely implement to, to lock in um, those customers with a lot of support from our, our current partners who are looking to um, become real champions for us in the space. And then my last question before we move on to our next startup of the night would be, if you guys fail, why will it be? Um, I think at this point, you know, I'm always thinking about how, like, what is the most risky thing that we're about to do? <laughs> um, and right now, um, you know, we're, so one of the great things about the industry at this point in biotech is that we're working with external partners for our manufacturing. Um, we don't need to build a facility ourselves, but that does come with risk um, in terms of working with external parties, in terms of supply chain and timing. And so even though, you know, we, we think we have the partners lined up, we have in-house expertise around the bioprocess and development and manufacturing. One of the greatest risks in the next, you know, year, which would be the timeline that we might fail and, you know, is the critical next step would be issues in supply chain and getting the product to our, our, our customers when they need it, because it is a fairly seasonal market. Uh, when we deliver the product is incredibly important. And so it could really, it's, it's essential that we, um, you know, deliver the product before they go out to sea for um, their their round of fishing. Makes sense. There's no uh, there's no one day Amazon gets it to delivery in the middle of the ocean. No. Very, uh, <laughs> yeah. So very... we're um, <clears throat> what I'll say is our lead investors for this round specialize in logistics and supply chain management, and we're doing a residency <clears throat> um, with them and a number of other companies specifically to make sure that we have that expertise um, in house and with advisors in place, but. I'm, I'm very aware that that will be um, incredibly critical as we grow. Yes, it, yes, it will. Yes, it will. Well, then, Paige, thanks for thanks for presenting. Brian, Jake, do you have any last questions for Paige? Uh, the only, yeah, the only follow on I had on the sustainability point was just you mentioned genome toxicity. I think was your word. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Just curious. In a sh probably unfairly short answer, kind of what the impact of that is. Like, is it? Are we talking kind of nuclear radiation level? Or are we talking kind of microplastic level? No. Um. So oh, there's a paper that came out in 2014 specifically on chemical lures and the impact of the contents. And they found that there was genetic mutations caused in concentrations as low as one in 10,000, um, you know, of dilution with water. So not completely radiation level, you know. <clears throat> it's not, um, you know, releasing any kind of radiation, but if it is consumed, um, especially for marine creatures, there's, there's quite a risk there. And if, you know, you get it on your skin or, or it's consumed as some, some of these products are, are um, marketed as children's toys. And I, I always get stories now of how people like will crack. Um, it, once there's as like glow sticks, you can find at the, the dollar store um, are incredibly hazardous and, and really should not be sold. Um, so in the future, <clears throat> if we're successful in the marine market and really have that as the, you know, foundation to launch a, a real like company off of, um, we'll be working to, as our best to um, get those off the market as well. So you're not a real company just with the marine products? No, we want to do it all. <laughs> yeah, I want, I was like, in 10 years, I want to frame like the last kind of chem stick that's ever made in our headquarters. You know, that's my dream. <laughs> I remember those little like snap them lights, uh, fluorescent things that were so much fun in the pool, but probably a terrible idea. Yeah, um, and a few people don't really know. And it's a growing body of research around just how hazardous they are. 
Mm -hmm. And they are, they are hazardous. Thank you, Paige, for what you're doing. Thank you, Matt. Thanks. I hope, Thank you, I hope this is successful. You. If you guys are interested in Paige and you're interested in Nyoka, then make sure to make sure to reach out. Hopefully I got the pronunciation right. Uh, we're going to take a, <laughs> while, while we, while we transition things over to, uh, an interesting, an interesting take on uh, an interesting take on recycling. I want to tell you guys a little bit more about us. So, Forward VC in the Startup Tank. If this is your first time, then the Startup Tank we feature awesome companies like this because they deserve the exposure, they deserve the funding. We invest in those companies, and they're the ones that have the biggest potential to change the world and have major outcomes. As you can see from some of these companies, there's going to be five to twenty-five trillion coming into climate tech in the next five to twenty-five years, and these are going to be the companies that change the world. If you want to learn more about us and what we do, the startuptank.com. You can subscribe on YouTube, the startuptank.com/slash/youtube, or any of your major podcasting platforms just by going to the startuptank.com com slash apple spotify etc cetera, etc cetera. and if you're interested we have an accredited investor syndicate we're not soliciting you but if you come to visit us we would love to chat forwards.vc the number four ward.vc and now let's hand things over to dylan with lasso loop recycling to look at a new way of recycling Awesome. Thanks, Matt. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen here. Go for it. Right, and then you can uh, you can share the new way we handle waste management. Tell me when That's you're right. ready, and then we'll start the timer. All right. Ready when you are. Let's roll. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dylan Nicholson. I'm with Alasso Loop Recycling. And essentially what we're doing is we're introducing a new way to recycle that's based on purity and traceability. To solve the problems of recycling, what we need to do is to decentralize it. No different than we're seeing across other industries, we need to put recycling at the forefront of where it needs to happen. And that's exactly where human beings put two or more materials into the same bin. We're seeing all kinds of innovation happen on the back end of recycling, uh, and to, to really solve the problem, we have to flip it on its head and we have to make it be about purity from the start. Uh, here are a few of my colleagues, Aldous Hicks. He's the original founder. He has 30 years of experience in materials handling and mining. Uh, Phil Sanders, our CTO, he comes to us from the appliance industry. He's been building um, appliances, leading the R&D department for Electrolux, which is the world's uh, one of the world's largest appliance manufacturers. And Dominique Leonard, she's leading our marketing and growth. I will speak to some of the metrics that her and her team have been able to achieve in the last year. And Dr. Yannick Rubilin joins us uh, from the UK, where he is a professor of electrical engineering. He's doing all of our embedded software systems, making the hardware and software uh, work well together. So um, as we all know, recycling is a problem. Uh, over 90% of Americans claim that they recycle, they enjoy recycling. And yet, despite billions and billions of dollars in subsidies and non-compete government contracts, um, about 80% of what you put into your blue bin actually goes to waste. The, behind this, this slide is, is what the recycling industry today produces, and it's mountains of valueless materials. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to continue to do so because the unit economics of recycling are cost prohibitive. And when you look at a graph or diagram like this, there's no, there's no question of why. Each one of these red touch points represents not only a cost, but also CO2 emissions. And the problem here is that there's no way to track or trace these materials through the post-consumer supply chain. Uh, we have these diagrams built out if you're interested. Uh, please feel free to shoot me an email. Um, but we have these diagrams built out for glass and for, plastic, or for metals as well. And the process is no different. However, if you were to decentralize recycling and able to process these materials in the comfort of a home or anywhere that humans put two materials in the same bin, you, you create all kinds of value. Number one, you're able to streamline the process, get rid of all kinds of inefficiencies. We estimate that's about six times more efficient to recycle this way as compared to uh, the current system. Uh, we're also able to track and trace the materials throughout the supply chain so we can return things like carbon offset credits back to the consumer. We can reward consumers and we'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. But basically 
think of the technology as, as an appliance. It's about the size of a dishwasher with a microwave on top of it. And it has a few different chambers. The first chamber is a sensor chamber. Uh, then we have a wash box to clean and dry the material. We remove the label. Uh, and then it goes into one of our three processors. So there's a plastic granulator, metal shredder, and a glass crusher. From there, it's further subdivided uh, by material type and color, where you'll pop out the bottom of the appliance. It's about the size of a suitcase on wheels, roll it to your curb, and be collected by either ourselves or one of our um, on-demand collection partners. We do have patents worldwide uh, on this appliance. And there's also a huge B2B element here. Um, every company on earth is coming out with their net zero target. Oftentimes they're pushing those targets back and there's no reason, or, and, there's, and there's no wonder why. You have your typical family, they purchase these products from CPGs around the world. They throw them into the blue bin to feel good. One minute warning. We wind up with low recycling rates, incomplete data and unrecoverable scope three emissions. Um, if we flip recycling on its head, like I mentioned, we create all kinds of value on both sides of the table. On one hand, we can go to these CPGs and provide them with a data set that no one else can provide. We can go back to the Coca-Colas of the world and say, hey, we know when Matt likes to drink Coca-Cola or we know when Jake wants to have you know, a bottle of wine. So we can go back to them and reward their consumers or provide a way for them to reward their consumers for reducing their scope three emissions and creating closed loop products with the materials that they've already produced. And then on the other hand, consumers get to all kinds of benefits. They can receive rewards from fast moving consumer good companies. They'll receive a take rate on the product sales themselves and they get to reduce their, scar their scope three emissions because at the end of the day, this is a system that actually recycles. And your time is up. A system that recycles, a totally different way of thinking about recycling. I know I talked to Jake previously and I see I see a lot of interesting. The reason I was so interested in it is because I kind of hate it and feel like it's wrong and that's not the right way to do it. And yet somehow the the numbers still work out in a, in a pretty interesting way for making recycling um, larger scale and higher, uh, higher opt-in, so to speak, or higher utility. Where... Ah, uh, Brian, there you are. I was having trouble finding you for some reason. You wanna you wanna kick things off, Jake? Yeah, sure. So I think in the circularity space, what's really interesting from a generic startup point of view, so forgive me guys, this is less of a question, more of a musing, morphing into a question, is that consumer attitudes need to change. You can see that in the UK, one of the biggest grocers ended a trial. A reusable packaging solution because it said that consumers weren't there yet, which is ironic because the whole startup, lean startup ethos is meeting customers and consumers where they're at. So on the one hand, I totally see how this works. You know, you're taking existing packaging solutions, you're providing a recycling outlet. There's still the question as to whether people want a relatively large appliance in their home for that. So I think that'd be the first question. But then to just add a second one on that on the same theme, Recycling's an answer, but I think the jury's out as to whether it's the best answer. Because from a CPG point of view, it's still very difficult. They can't mandate customers treat waste in a certain way. And so we're seeing an increasing number of them move to reuse rather than recycling, whereby there's a reverse logistics element to their offering. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious how you think about Lasso the long-term, medium-term, et cetera, of recycling versus reuse and how you play into that. And mm -hmm. then that first question around how you guys can, how are consumers from your kind of initial traction, um, wait list, et cetera, how comfortable are they about having a, this relatively large appliance in their home where previously they probably had a slightly smaller bin or an under sink bin, trash can, et cetera? Yeah, yeah, great questions. I'll try to answer both quickly. Um, so I like to think about uh, 20 years into the future and like, let's work our way back. 20 years from now, we're gonna be installing these appliances in any place that human beings put two or more materials into the same bin. We're gonna do it with no upfront cost to anyone. And we're gonna finance it based off of the materials that are processed. Now, obviously we can't start 20 years in the future. So what we do need to start with are the altruistic eco-warriors, the folks that bought the first Teslas, the people that bought the first consumer solar uh, before it necessarily had an ROI. 
um, to really lead the charge. And that's where we've, we've uh, had our most traction. We have over 5,000 reservation holders. Um, we've already done a pre-sale campaign back in February as well. And we'll be rolling this out in a land and expand model where uh, we'll focus on San Francisco, LA, maybe New York, um, Austin, Texas in a sequential manner so that we can prove out the number one, the return on, on um, not only CO2 emissions, but also the share of the product sales. And then also uh, prove out the back end logistics system as well. Now, this is just the entry point, though, because this is going to replace you know, the waste management collection services of apartment buildings, of um, hotels, restaurants, schools, um, any, any, any situation where human beings put two or more materials into the same bin, we're creating the problem that is recycling today. To riff on your point about the ethos and playing into reuse versus uh, recycling, you're totally right. If you look on our Instagram, uh, we are prolific in trying to share and educate people on, on uh, reuse strategies, on reduction strategies, on refusal strategies, but holistically, uh, if we look at this, uh, look at recycling as a global problem, which is exactly what it is, um, the developing world is going to be 30 to 50 years out from being able to catch up to get off of plastic, for example. So if we can decentralize recycling in Africa, if we can decentralize recycling in low income communities across the world, uh, we're going to be able to create tremendous value, not just for the people who make the right decision to recycle, but for the planet as a whole. Thanks. I appreciate sure. that. Um, yeah, and I love that decentralizing recycling. So thanks. One follow-up question on that to decentralize recycling in the developing world. How cheap of a price point are you going to need though? Absolutely. Um, that, that'll, that will come. <laughs> You're totally right. Um, and, and it'll be financed by the materials that, that are, that are processed. I mean, just for example, if you take a one ton of PET plastic out of a landfill, you're going to pay about $240 a ton. If you have pure, PET flakes, that value goes up to around $2,000 to $2,400 uh, $2, a ton. So you're almost 10xing the value of material by not having to go through all that those steps in the diagram. So yeah, we're definitely going to have to have a, a price point that's accessible, but the value of the materials goes up tremendously and we'll be able to finance it. So um, the, just to ju jump in there about the product itself. Sure. Um, just curious why you chose and when it was developed and kind of the go-to-market strategy was for direct to consumer as a starting mm -hmm. point versus yep. going to you know businesses that have influence on what they're like uh, you know a lot of different companies and, and corporate entities are looking to reduce their their carbon intensity on their operations and just mm -hmm. by a function of any which way they can do it so putting yep. this into you know, even into just like their office um, or to other things where you're going to have a higher amount of essentially uh, end raw material because of the amount of people that are going to be throwing things in there and getting, because that's almost like a, a forced, um, uh, you know, forced people's perspectives and to be utilizing this if it's like at, at their office or as you said like a school or other things like there and then and then also just from getting to a certain level of cost on the materials that you're going to be paying back the volume certainly is going to be a lot higher at those more centralized points so just curious to why you started with the consumer versus saying go to a business first mm -hmm. to have something yeah yeah great question um we we went where the market uh, was willing to pay, uh, the direct-to-consumer model. We've already pre-sold these appliances. Uh, we did an equity crowdfunding campaign back in 2019 with the direct-to-consumer model. Uh, they were the folks that supported us. So that was very much kind of, you know, uh, the wind behind our sales, if you will. And we are working on a multifamily apartment building unit as well, uh, as well as a, a bar and restaurant application, uh, because you're totally right. You know, the volume is there, but the 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 crux of what we're doing, though, is really making recycling be based on purity instead of it being based on volume. So we have to get it 
immediately at the entry point in order for this system to work. Otherwise, we're just putting everything into the same bin and then trying to separate it out again. So um, the application is obviously very different for a um, co-working studio, if you will, or an apartment building. It's going to be a much larger unit. Um, I spent a few weeks out in London this summer and I saw you know, the writing on the wall that this has to be a large unit outside of council block homes where you know, kids can walk up with their phone ding who they are uh, by a QR code and load it up with their families recycling and receive instant rewards. So like that's, that's the application in, on um, a grander scale. But yeah, right now we're starting with the, the, um, the high net worth individuals that understand recycling is a problem. They're willing to pay for it so we can prove that this model works. I actually want to double click there because Brian, that was a brilliant idea. I think malls cafeterias, schools, corporates are the go-to for this. You have so much more volume and they are willing to look at things from a business perspective and say, this makes me money. Yes, it takes time, but there's an ROI. And it also makes me look good to my employees or it makes right. our mall look good, or it's a new type of vending machine that gets put in that makes more money for the mall or for the, the school, et cetera, et cetera. Well yeah, and, and to riff on what you guys are saying, um, what we're, we've been working on is a financing vehicle in order to be able to finance those higher price point um, devices to go to the schools, to be able to go to uh, the bars and restaurants and say, we can install this for free. It's going to be you know $500 a month or for to handle all of your recycling. We can collect it on the front end. So that's, that's really the next big inflection point for us. And then obviously following that will be... Um, government subsidy is no different than an EV or a consumer solar tax credit. Yeah, I mean, even depending on the adoption, say if you went to a business or a larger type of organization and you have people involved in it, um, mm -hmm. especially on the corporate side, having, I, I almost look like there's potential for, um, to entice with incentives to their employees saying that we'll get a rebate versus like, you know, some, uh, there's some companies that do like, you know, a stipend for certain types of activities that become their employees are more sustainable, like having, you know, a bike or electric type of mobility solution or something. They give the employees that. Um, and I've been seeing more and more of those type of activities from corporate entities that are looking to get their employee base more sustainable. And so, um, Again, it kind of goes back to where I saw this as a good avenue is on the on the kind of this on a B2B sales point to then get to the consumer. Uh, but I can understand from where you're getting from your funding sources to get off the ground to get there, it's chicken. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And we're working at it on all fronts. I mean, this is this is like I said, it's a global problem. We need to have an application for Asia. We need to have an application for Europe. And those are going to be very different machines. Um, but yeah, we're, we're really excited to tackle this from a, a decentralized perspective. Just, just said it, um, do you have, I, and I don't know if it was in your, um, in your, in your deck, just quickly, mm -hmm. do you have estimations on what a potential payback period would look like for this type of application with like what you would expect for the input materials to kind mm -hmm. of what, what's, what's coming back and. Also, I would say, you know, excluding maybe the carbon or green credit piece because, you know, it's still in its infancy and it's hard to gauge on um, what that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so for a typical family of four, based off uh, normal consumption habits, you're looking at about a $600 a year return. And that's with us also capturing uh, revenue, uh, but it's a $600 a year return back to the family. And at a $3,500 price point, this device pays itself off in three to five years at launch with no financing, with no hardware as a service model, um, which is considerably ahead, uh, you know, a solar uh, comparison. Got it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My question would, for you would be, what's the progress? What's happened since we last talked? And what is happening in the next month or two that has you excited and why? Oh man, I can't say. I can't. I can't share what's uh, what's exciting, but you'll definitely see it in the press uh, in the next month or so. But we do have some very exciting partnerships, uh, both on the government side as well as the B two B side. 
uh, where you guys are all alluding to. So we're excited to share those here um, in the next two weeks, hopefully. Um, and yeah, in terms of that, we've also landed a partnership with Trash Warrior. They do on-demand collection for recycling, uh, very much in line with what we're doing. So we can double down on their back-end logistics. Um, and then, yeah, the two other, the government and the big CPG partnership uh, will be announced shortly. Very good, very good. And my last question for you would be, how big can this get? Sky's the limit. I mean, this is a four and a half trillion dollar market opportunity by 2030. That's from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. If we can introduce circularity and stop pillaging the planet to produce petrochemical based plastics and reuse the plastics we've already made, uh, we're going to have a tremendous benefit on keeping plastics out of our ocean, keeping you know, valuable materials out of our landfill and stop burning up materials as a waste to energy recycling plant. So uh, it's a very exciting problem to be tackling. And, and as you guys can see, it's, it's a massive one. It is a massive one. There's way too much that gets thrown out. It's basically everything in your garbage is some type of food packaging. If you go look in your garbage, anyone who's at home, it's a, uh, it's hideous. It's terrible. And that's, uh, that's why recycling's a, a big deal. Hopefully, uh, hopefully this has been helpful for you, Dylan. Hopefully people are interested and either way, we need to move on to our next company of the night to make sure that everybody gets their fair shot. And before we do, I want to let you all know again that today's episode of the Startup Tank, the Climate Investor Pitch Show, the Climate Shark Tank, the best place to find climate companies, period, is brought to you guys by Valbon, uh, Carta from Valbon. So we set up our SPVs with Valbon. We do that because we love the hands-on service they have. They help us with managing everything from entity creation, bank account creation, working with LPs, collecting the funding, managing the SPV, anything that we need. It's a perfect platform for absolutely easy, fast setup, rollout SPVs that you know are also legally approved, that are totally above the board and very reliable when you're dealing with big numbers, which our goal is to be dealing with big numbers pretty soon. You can find out more about us at forward.vc and where we're headed with those big numbers. And for founders out there and investors, if you need a good software for cap table management, Carta is the tool. Carta bought Valbon. They are the big player in the space. And the best way to manage your cap table, your employee options, and all of that fun stuff is Carta. Forward.vc slash Carta for more details and let them know that forward or the, stint, the startup tank sent you so that they uh, get a little love for supporting us and that it helps us keep the lights on. Speaking of, I probably have to turn my lights on. It's getting a little bit dark here. And now I want to, uh, I want to hand things off to our next company of the night. So we were reducing waste. Why not reduce it a bit further and go over to Greg with Myro. Greg and Myro, they are revolutionizing reusable consumer products, but in a cool way <clears throat> with folks like Serena, Carmelo Anthony and uh, a lot of other pretty exciting, uh, pretty exciting things happening. You want to take it away, Greg, and tell people what of course. you're doing at Myro? Hey guys, uh, can you hear me and see me? Everything, everything you working? are, you are good, and your time starts now. All right, amazing. So, uh, so Myro is a reusable body care brand, and uh, obviously we're all here because we understand the plastic problem. We just talked about it extensively. The way that we are reframing that problem is that there's a better way than a culture of disposability. Therefore, reusability is the solution. So to give you a sense of how we're approaching this, um, we're building a multi-billion dollar brand that's focused specifically on body care because anytime you walk into your bathroom, it's really easy to see the single-use plastic that's there. So we launched with a couple of categories, notably deodorant and body wash. And now we're expanding into eight different categories of products. They all share the same characteristic. There's a reusable vessel that gets bought once, and then there's refill, refills that are either plastic-free or plastic-reducing. So to give you a sense of uh, you know, quantifying what this looks like, I think Jake here mentioned that reusability is, is certainly a big trend, and we see you know, people say that, and we see that in real data. So the expectation is the beauty category is gonna be worth about 4 billion in a few years. Now, to give you a sense of our scale, so we launched in 2019 with a single category, just deodorants. To date, we've sold over a million units of the product. We're distributed in roughly 2,000 stores across the US. 
uh, happen to be the largest privately owned deodorant brand that's refillable. And uh, we're just approaching and building distribution across partners that are, you know, that move these products. Uh, so people like Target.com, Bath Bet and Beyond, QVC, and the like. Um, to, so one interesting insight that we learned along the way is that, uh, again, to go back to you know some of the discussion that we had earlier, people who are interested in sustainable products are interested in these products, but they're not willing to change their habits. And what we found is that as long as the end behavior is the same as that they were used to, they're more than welcome to, they're more than open to trying product that simply changes the way that they shop. And that seems to have been a big unlock for our products. So the way that we're building out a portfolio is based on three non-negotiable value props. The first one is there's a certain ingredient standard that we follow and the products have to perform their basic function. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how sustainable or usable the deodorant is. If you stink, it's game over. So plant powered ingredients and products that perform, that's one. The second one is we think that reusability and reusable packaging is this unique form factor that gets the best of both worlds, delivering the benefit while not changing your end use habits. And by the way, we have three patents that we've gotten along the way just because we've been experimenting so much. And the last thing is we found that having the products look beautiful so that they're worth keeping is actually a really big deal. So here's an example of our core product. This is a reusable deodorant. Someone comes to us, purchases a one-time container that's meant to be kept forever. And then they purchase these refill pods that are inserted into the container so that you, you reduce plastic waste. That simple idea is a 50% waste reduction. Here's another example. This is a body wash based on a concentrate product. You purchase a one-time bottle, you then purchase a, an aluminum tube with a concentrate, you squeeze the tube into the bottle, you shake for 10 seconds and you end up with a luxurious body wash. So no plastic, no water, no carbon spent on shipping the water around. Again, material plastic reduction. And we're just blowing it out. Here's a fragrance product following the similar model. So it's either the concentrate with an aluminum tube or it's a, it's a refill that reduces plastic by the sheer idea of having a permanent container. Now, what we've learned about uh, selling this is that it really takes an endorsement to sell a product like this because we're dealing with categories that have been around forever. So we've attracted people like Serena Williams and Alex Morgan to help, help us spread the word. Once somebody tries it, we see that over 60% of people come back to us and purchase again, which is a pretty wild number given the fact that we're dealing with you know, categories that are 100 years old. Um, behind the scenes, it's a, you know, high gross margins. We're projecting LTVs of over 100 bucks. We're instantly profitable when sold to wholesale and already seeing very favorable paybacks. Um, to put a sense of the scale, so we did about 2 million of the revenue last year. We're on track to do about three plus change this year. And next year is really gonna be an inflection year with some of the partnerships that are coming online. So the team is, uh, the team is uh, very small, but very efficient with folks that have done this before. There's about eight of us, you know, most coming from either CPG companies or direct to consumer companies that are you know, basically hitting at our core strengths. And like I mentioned, we have the unique advantage of being able to bring some of the top celebrity names to help us you know, spread the word because it is a consumer brand. So what we're here to do is we're fundraising and we're looking to fill about 800 that's left in our 2 million round, which hopefully gets us to, you know, get some of these new products out, uh, look into some of the B2B revenue streams that are knocking on our door and then get us to a series A, which is the big inflection point for next year. Thank you. Awesome. Very good. And without even needing the one minute stopwatch, because <laughs> yours truly sometimes has a little bit of trouble with having everything there. But uh, let me bring back the other investors while we are doing that. Um, I'm sure everyone that's watching is wondering how you had such high revenues previously and then what the heck happened? Can you walk me through the COVID stinky, uh, stinky explanation in terms of supply chains and deodorant? Yeah, of course. So our first full year of business was 2019 and we came out of the market swinging. We did over 7 million in revenue in the first year. Um, unfortunately, we learned the hard way that um, when COVID happens and everybody goes into lockdown, uh, nobody uses deodorants. <laughs> so this is a real, real fact that I have real data to prove. So our supply chain, uh, you know, completely collapsed uh, along with the demand in the market. Um, so we had to, you know, remarket, regroup and just focus on diversifying our portfolio and focus on the R&D. But the COVID, uh, COVID debacle was definitely something that's, uh, that was, you know, a big uh, trial and tribulation for me as a founder and uh, 
something that we've lived through and learned uh, the hard way that, you know, you need to have a portfolio of products and the loyal customers in order to, you know, grow and expand and, and build on early successes. Thanks for thanks for clarifying that. And I, I found it funny too. I saw sorry. I don't want to <laughs> laugh at I don't want to laugh at your plight. That's one thing I found actually very impressive with Greg was the fact that he was able to grow so quickly and then cut cut staff and keep things afloat and still have a business in a position today where it is a very, a very interesting business. Something certainly we're looking at. Um Jake, do you wanna do you wanna kick things off this time? Yeah, sure. So um it looks like you've got some great distribution. Mm -hmm. distribution can be expensive obviously you've got to do activation and as you mentioned awareness <clears throat> and it looks like you of all people and with the founding team you get that so i'm just keen to dig into why equity fundraising for this because i know there are an increasingly array increasingly innovative array of revenue-based financing options which certainly mm -hmm. for cpg brands can be quite attractive so i sit on the board of a home home care business in the uk and they're utilizing revenue-based financing pretty successfully to minimize dilution. So just keen to understand what you're thinking is around that. And then also just to understand about how you scale this and how you get through point, throughput, sorry, through this distribution and how much you think that is going to cost you guys as a business. Yeah, no, all very relevant questions, something that we think about every day. Uh, so to answer your question, equity versus debt. So we're, we're looking at both is the, is the answer. We're trying to sort of separate our equity capital that will go towards launching, um, you know, the R&D behind some of these products and getting them out to the market. So the new launches are focused on, you know, where the equity capital is deployed. And then the debt capital, which were, you know, sort of separately have vehicles for on the side, are mostly there to finance existing relationships and existing purchase orders. Um, so we already have relationships with a lot of these uh, retail partners. We already have... Uh, uh, you know, that relationships with uh, revenue-based providers that are, that work and understand these kind of simple CPG businesses. So we're certainly focusing on both sides of the house, um, but the equity piece is much more geared towards the sort of the new product launches where it's, uh, you know, it's not as clear to explain to an old school entity, you know, how that sort of how that facial wash comes to life and that requires the equity capital. So hopefully that answers your first question. In terms yeah. of your second question, um, the capital requirements and do we understand uh, you know, what's involved in kind of getting some of these, supporting some of these channels? Um, so the way that we've always thought about the business is that uh, it has to be an omni-channel business. What this really means to us is that we are using direct-to-consumer uh, to self-pay for the marketing of the brand, of the product, and of the awareness. And here's a simple example. Uh, you know, best in class e-commerce conversion rates are what, you know, five to 8%, which means that even on the best day, over 90% of people, you know, come to your site, get exposed to your ads, get exposed to your message, but never transact. So with a wholesale channel behind it, with all these wholesale partners, we have a unique opportunity to funnel these 90% towards fulfilling that untransacted demand in retail. So the way that we thought about it is that direct-to-consumer is this giant marketing machine that happens to pace for itself and then uses the spillover demand to drive trial at retail. How are you currently? Okay, I, think, uh, I think that, so, sorry, I was just to close that off. No, I think no, that kind of makes yeah, sense. Yeah, right, right. But um, I think the challenge with big retail is it's easy to get an initial buyer to say, yep, love it. This is innovative. I can see how this fits in. But then to like activate that brand across a large geographical market like the US, you know, it's paying for promotions, et cetera, offering them discounts, all of those sorts of things, educating users. And obviously it's more, you know, you mentioned you've got some impressive retention figures, but that's obviously more difficult to do when you don't control the whole customer experience and say a target or, or wherever. So it's just more thinking about how are you, the question, sorry, is more, how are you thinking about activating those B2B channels and how much do you think mm -hmm. that's going to cost you over the, beyond just the seed round? Understood. Um, so in terms of the how, the number one thing that we learned about activating in these categories in general is that um, no amount of kind of splashy ads or just kind of flashy commercials actually work. It's really, it really truly does become about 
um, some sort of this endorsement by an individual and entity that you as a consumer trust. So all of our marketing is focused on endorsement-based marketing. And that means that the reason why we're going and getting, you know, these uh, celebrity investors and these influencers and working with DJs is primarily because we see that for a hundred year old, century old categories, it takes somebody that you trust to say, hey, go check out Myra because it's better for you and the planet. So that frames how we need to think about marketing and how we need to think about the activation. And by the way, we see that to be true across the category, irrespective of distribution. Now, in terms of the capital required to finance uh, supporting these at mass scale, uh, you're 100% right. This uh, seed round is certainly just the beginning. Um, the plan, the default plan is to raise a Series A, you know, five to $7 million Series A in the summer of next year. Um, once we are, uh, you know, having eight categories live, um, once we have a uh, run rate of basically 10, $11 million, which we're projecting to 2023, and once we have uh, some initial sell-through data, that puts us into that kind of ballpark of five to seven million Series A, which allows us to then further support, you know, the growth and the continued demand generation of those products. So certainly, you're right on that. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. I really appreciate that. Um, so, for what's what's the current split across those channels? I mean, I presume you started at a direct consumer model and then you've expanded to the wholesale and then looking at uh, at retail and then I guess secondarily to to that question on the revenue model itself um, on the at the the former you, perhaps it's a distribution model you also might have a subscription model that's built in there too but with as you go to things into retail, that would be more of just pure play distribution model. How, how, how are you thinking about that? Um, so in terms of direct to consumer business, um, I don't have the exact number of hand, but something like 80% of transactions are recurring revenue. So overwhelmingly people purchase subscription just because it's an easy one to subscribe. You get the permanent case once and then you just go on autopilot. It's just a, such, a, such a natural thing to do. Uh, so we certainly see that in, in D2C. Um, in terms of the revenue split, it, the revenue ends up being very choppy because retail is just very choppy, right? Like no, no retailer, like, you know, or some periodic basis with, you know, crystal clear clarity. It's always up and down, up and down. Um, so when you zoom out, the revenue split is actually about 60% D2C, 40% retail. And probably over time, it'll even out to more or less 50-50. Um, but it's, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's very choppy just given the nature of the channel itself. What about B2B? Hotels. So we've gotten a fair amount of inbound from uh, B2B, especially in uh, kind of, you know, California and New York, there's a lot of legislation that's coming out um, because we basically have the, you know, the packaging, the juice, the products. Um, we've done admittedly very little on the B2B side. That's one of the areas that we want to double click with, with this equity capital because people are knocking on our door and there's, you know, people are being forced into this and we kind of have 95% of the product, but we just haven't resourced it properly. So it's not a great answer, Matt, <laughs> but uh, this is a huge, huge opportunity that we're sort of, uh, just haven't been able to address just given uh, this year, your priority to date. Um, but that's one area that we're specifically looking to do for the next 12 months. Okay. If I gave you $5 million right now, what would you do? What would be your next steps? Uh, so $5 million gets us to uh, expand to about 12 products instead of eight. It allows us to hire a sales team that unlocks um, the hotel channel and the hospitality channel. And it allows us an opportunity to probably support a much bigger launch, which means a much bigger share and a much stronger velocity across retail. So we are in a, you know, this is a, we're building a, a multi-billion global brand here. And uh, demand and being first mover advantage in a lot of its categories is a really big deal. So developing strong relationships with retailers, showing them that we can support the launches with real dollars, with real material, real people, right? Like these influencers and celebrities, they all cost capital, but they, they are a necessary part of building a brand that then creates a flywheel effect. Um, because these retailers, uh, they like to, you know, double down on you and go go in with one category, then the second category, and 
um, you know, by the time you're done, you end up with uh, with a very material share of that shelf space, which builds on itself. So it just allows it to go much, much faster. Okay. And going much, much faster, where do you stand in terms of the influencer, the athlete model, getting the the big names on board and trying to trying to get some traction? I know we talked a little bit about that, and there was seems to be a lot of potential. Yeah, no, there is a there is a ton of potential in that side. Um, so, like I said, we're working with uh, already Carmelo Anthony is an investor, Serena Williams is an investor. Uh, we just brought on another uh, kind of women's soccer player who's uh, going to be, uh, you know, uh, closely associated. You brought on the ca- you brought on the captain. <laughs> so, so we have. Um, there's a we are true to what I said before. The strategy of endorsement being the lead marketing driver is something that we you know we passionately believe in because we see it you know we just see it in data. Um, so that's the model that we'll follow. And uh, certainly, as we continue to build the relationships with key distribution partners, um, as we build our direct consumer business, it allows us to basically deploy that uh, endorsement influence strategy to a greater degree because the names get a lot bigger with a bigger following, which allows the snowball effect to continue. Very cool. Very cool. Well, then, thanks for thanks for presenting. Any other questions, Jake, Brian? Yeah. No, thank you very no, much. That's it for me. And let's keep let's keep the ball rolling then. So we did uh, we that's did great. consumer we did consumer products. Mm-hmm. How about we go uh, exact opposite now and go buildings and energy? Natty Freiberg with uh, Fonto Power. Natty, do you want to take things over? Share a Hi. little bit more about what you guys are doing. Yep. Okay. First, uh, thanks, Matt, for uh, presenting the company. Absolutely. That's what I'm here for. Now it's your job to kill the presentation. You got five okay. minutes. You ready to roll? Hold on. Yes. Okay. Take it away. Thanks. Uh, so again, so as Matt says, um, uh, said, uh, we're all about enhancing building energy resiliency, decarbonization, and affordability. Well, it's called the energy trilemma. Uh, as you probably have uh, heard this uh, term. So, I mean... You're, you're probably aware of the uh, world's mega energy mega trends, uh, renewable energy penetration, electrification, and EVs, which is a part of the electrification, but I put it aside because you know it happens much faster and in a much larger scale. All the three mega trends uh, already causing um, huge electricity demand uh, a increase anywhere between 200 to 500% within the next uh, uh, two decades. Uh, severe energy resiliency issues. I mean, once you put more re- renewable, uh, and if you add the uh, the global warming and so forth, you can see a huge amount of uh, outages and, and, and resiliency issues, uh, which is going to be more severe in the future, of course. And it requires trillions of of dollars to uh, uh, to upgrade the grid. One survey, by the way, just took um, um, made a uh, a survey or a research, how much would it cost to um, to change uh, UK from boilers to um, heat pumps? And the investment in the infrastructure is 1 trillion uh, um, euros just for one country. So it's a huge amount of money to upgrade the network. As for buildings, this is what we're doing. Uh, most buildings are west a huge amount of energy have high CO2 NOx emissions, if you're talking about boilers and so forth, are prone to power outages. I mean, 99.99% of the buildings rely on the public grid. Uh, there are, also, there are only 5,000 CHP projects in the US, um, of which 150 are commercial buildings uh, out of like 6 million. So it's 99.99%. And limited, limited the electrical capacity, since it's very hard and difficult to upgrade the uh, building um, uh, electrical network. If you want now to upgrade your building to cope with the additional of uh, EVs and heat pumps, in most cases, the utility would say no. I mean, the, there is no capacity. Uh, just to give an example, a high voltage line would take about 14 years, anywhere between 10 to 20 years to put in place, and you need a huge amount of high voltage lines. So it takes decades to electrify everything. So that's why people think that um, in 250, uh, you can actually electrify 50% of the energy and 50% will still be relying on either re- renewable natural gas or green hydrogen 
or both. So this is the amount of commercial buildings in the US. And this is so six million. Most of them, the majority of the, of the buildings are less than 25,000 um, square, square meter, or 25,000, sorry, square foot, 2,500 square meter, which means that the majority of the buildings consume an average um, anywhere between 30 to 100 kilowatts uh, at any given point. This is the average um, of the buildings. On the left-hand side, this is the reference scenario. So this is what exists now in Europe and in North America. You have two utilities, the electrical uh, grid and the natural gas grid, okay? It's about 50-50, 50% and of the energy comes from the natural grid. Boilers, you, 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 um, you uh, warm up the water using boilers and 50% comes from the electricity. And on the right-hand side, this is the, the system that we are developing. The idea is to use the current natural gas uh, to do uh, a much more efficient uh, way of generating energy. So we are using software optimized uh, SOFC, which are special uh, solid oxide fuel cell, working on both natural gas or green hydrogen or hydrogen or any combination. So now the EU is planning to blend 20% of green hydrogen into the current natural gas. And the idea that it will get to 100% green hydrogen or green uh, or, nat or, or renewable uh, natural gas by 2035, uh, we combine it with rechargeable batteries and lots of software. So the idea is to predict uh, the building um, energy requirements and to adjust uh, using the natural grid and to provide a, up to 100% of the building uh, with the natural gas uh, network. So this, this is a typical uh, pattern of energy consumption of buildings. You can see there are very low power consumption at night, peak at, 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 at mid noon time. So the idea we can generate uh, the yellow line, it's what we generate with the SOFC. We combine it with batteries. So at any given point, we can provide the energy of the building. So for example, the peak time- we 30 second warning. From the uh, SOFC plus the rechargeable batteries. Uh, as for CO2 emissions from day one, using natural gas, we can do it with 240 grams per, uh, per one uh, kilowatt hour. Uh, the EU has labeled anything below 270 as green up to 2035. This is the new uh, uh, rule made by the EU. And the more green hydrogen into uh, uh, blended into the network, it will reduce up to zero. And your time is up. Now I'm bringing the other investors in. Can you share um, what you're raising and uh, what the status of the company is currently? Yes, yeah, so currently we are, I mean, we have raised from the Israeli Ministry of Energy and private investors about half billion dollars. And now we are raising an additional $2 million and the Israeli innovation with complemented by addition of 1 million. So it will be 3 million, but one will be from the Israeli innovation. So $2 million of, um, um, of current uh, of current fundraising. Is that dilutive or non-dilutive from the Israeli innovation? The 1 million is non-dilutive. Mm -hmm. oh, that's always very helpful. Israel, yeah. does a, Israel does a great job with funding for companies. We just did an Israeli battery tech company and you guys just have so much in terms of grants and funding. Yep, correct. Mm -hmm. So um, one quick kickoff question. With everything that's happening in the world these days, how do you see that affecting Fonto Power? So natural gas, the, the pipeline getting blown up, prices skyrocketing. What does that do for you guys in terms of your attractiveness for buildings and real estate? So, I mean, it's, the more, I mean, uh, so I, I, I did an RI calculation based on the new uh, UK uh, uh, gas and electricity price gap. Okay, which is 39 uh, P's for uh, electricity and 10.3 uh, P's for, uh, for gas for one kilowatt. So the, the higher the prices, uh, the better we off because um, um, this is what it's called the, the spot spread, which is that since we, we generate the electricity locally, I mean, a gas turbine would do probably 45% elect electricity um, efficiency and well, and, and, and once it gets to your to your uh, to your house or to your office, you lose about ten percent on transmission and distribution. So it's, it's about thirty five percent efficiency. Efficiency. We do it at eighty five percent efficiency. So it's two point five uh, uh, times higher. So cost per kilowatt is much much lower. So the higher the gas prices, uh, the better use of our solution, uh, since you can reduce the gas price, uh, the, electric, the electrical price. Uh, dramatically. So the less gas you have, you have to use it carefully. Uh, 
By the way, if, if you do, I mean, if you just switch to heat pumps, okay, and use our technology, you can reduce the amount of gas by 70%. Sorry. By is 70%. Is switching the heat pumps mandatory with the solution you have? No, 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 not at all. Yeah. But, it, okay. but I mean, let's assume that you take 1 million BTU and you generate electricity uh, in a centralized station. So by the time that it gets to you, uh, it's about 40%, 35 to 30% um, um, efficiency. And if you do it with our system, it's it's 85%. So it's more than doubled. So with the same amount of gas, so let's put this in, uh, or in other words, we can use half million uh, BTUs to get the same amount of energy electricity that you generate today with one million BTU. Mm -hmm. So this is number one. Number two, the more natural, I mean, and natural gas will be here for a few decades, okay? And the idea is that it will be replaced by uh, green hydrogen, sorry, by green hydrogen and by uh, all re renewable natural gas or both. So nobody thinks that you can get rid of the molecules uh, for the next 20, 30. I mean, if you look at the EIA, they still predicted by 2050, US will generate 32% uh, of its electricity. Did you guys lose got... Nadi as well? Yeah, yeah I've got him frozen. Okay, I've got him frozen as well. I'll give it another couple of seconds. If he stays frozen, we can jump to our next company and then potentially jump back. Okay, this is a perfect time for us to tell you about Forward VC. So we run an early stage climate syndicate. So pre-seed and seed, we invest in companies that are changing the world in a big, big way. Uh, Exxon, our most recent investment, takes your car charging and makes it 100 times faster. So Bird can get rid of 65% of their scooters and batteries last 30 times as long sorry, because sorry, they're not I mean, degrading. Sorry, can you bear? I mean, there was a mis uh, disconnecting uh, here at my side. Can you repeat yeah, your question? Let me, we totally lost you, Nadi. I didn't get any of your question. Um, my, uh, but what I, what I wanted to ask, so what's that, what's the cost of implementing a system like this? What's the payback period with traditional gas prices, not in a, in a war scenario? Okay. So, I mean, the business model is energy as a service. So the idea is that we don't uh, sell uh, the equipment, but we offer a complete um, uh, solution. Um, we offer the customer a 10 year uh, PPA power purchase agreement. Okay, and we charge, of course, based on the uh, public electric uh, electricity prices, uh, and we take the differences. So at any given point, okay, we can generate the electricity at a much lower, since we are double in, in efficiency, and we do it locally, uh, and we don't have the peak demand and demand charges, uh, or, or the typical uh, uh, demand, uh, or the, 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 the typical charges that, that you are charged with your public uh, um, network. The idea is that we can keep anywhere between five to 10 cents profit per for every kilowatt that we sell. So, and if you're a typical building is about 60, our system is 60 kilowatt um, solution and 250 kilowatt hour of battery. So the idea is that the, the um, system will be able to generate at any given point, an average of 60 kilowatts. This is typical building and if, this is one system. If you have a bigger building, then you have two or three systems. Um, so it, I mean, as long as you generate energy from natural gas or coal, and this is, this is going to last for at least 20 or 30 years from now, uh, our solution will be cheaper because of the higher efficiency uh, locally. So with your, your, um, your application, obviously it's providing a grid edge solution to aug augment the needs of the grid, provide stabilization, provide some incentives. Is it, is, so by using solid oxide fuel cell on this, the software component's got to be pretty, pretty adept and sophisticated in order to match kind of peak timing. I presume you're, you're working that this then works with utilities on. No, 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 no. You're not, there's you're a not difference. No, no, no. There's a like difference between us and the other. Since we are behind the meter, okay. we have nothing to do with the grid. This is, a, this is a behind the meter. This is the first behind the meter solution. Okay. Unlike the competition like Bloom Energy or Fuel Cell, which mm -hmm. they're working with utilities. So we we thought that, you know, it, it will be, uh, uh, we thought to tackle this issue from the, high, from the, the behind the meter um, perspective. 
So we don't sell anything to the grid. That's the reason why the system uh, needs to adapt. So this will be the first time that SOFC load variation, because it, I mean, up until now, all the SOFC was working in a constant load. In our case, we are going to, to uh, vary the load. So the um, load will be from anywhere between 30, 20 to 30, 20, 30% up to 100%. And we do it in a very sophisticated way, uh, the load variation. So the idea is to have behind the meter without, grid, uh, of course, we'll be grid connected. But the idea, the grid connected is only if we decide to use the grid since the electricity is cheaper at any given point. But right. we don't rely. So our first customer now that we have signed an agreement is a big uh, US uh, real estate developer, which has 20,000 uh, buildings or, or units, sorry, apartment units. And the idea that they will offer to the customers both resiliency services, and of course they will compete with the public uh, grid network. So with with this, I mean, with this type of, do you have is a pretty standard solid oxide fuel cell technology for the actual the actual mechanism in place? Because yes. a lot of it has a lot of you know, it needs a fair amount of lead time on you know, powering up, getting uh, fueled properly in order to supplement the grid needs. And that's always been an ongoing thing on like the on-demand power is, it's, it's certainly slow on an uptake just because of the technology. Um, so is there, is, is that just a factor? I guess since you're behind the meter on this, it's just supplementary um, marginally to what really better serves the customer on energy costs and, and needs. But is there anything else that you're doing that that is augmenting like the uptime of um, of, of the actual um, technology for Fanta? You mean the uptime of the fuel cell? Correct. Yes, I mean, that's the whole idea. I mean, we don't switch off the, 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 the fuel cell, never. But what we do, the battery, um, so we, we complement, I mean, we are doing a two stage load variation with better, it's fast. It's a millisecond variation because we have four, I mean, on every one of every, of every one kilowatt that we uh, generate, we have about four to five kilowatt hour of battery. So this is the ratio one to four. So at any given point, if now we generate 60 and there are demand for 200 kilowatt, we still have lots of capacity in the battery. Uh, the problem is what happens if there is less capacity. So then we have to predict and then we have to reduce. It takes about one hour to reduce the load of the fuel cell without affecting the um, the performance and degradation of the fuel cell. So that's 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 our uh, that's part of our IP. We do uh, online uh, degradation performance analysis just to make sure that the fuel cells are not affected. But we do it in a very sophisticated way so the fuel cell is not affected. So it, it takes about half an hour to one hour to change the variation from 100% to 30%. So we do load prediction, which is not that uh, um, uh, problematic, you know, because building more or less the same building, of course, we learn uh, the way the building, the, the building pattern, it doesn't change much. And if it changes much, of course, batteries uh, can cap with fast changes. So batteries cap with the fast changes and the load variation cap with, for example, weekend. In the weekend time, uh, you know that every Friday you should reduce by 6 p.m. You should reduce the um, fuel cell to minimal. Uh, and if you add, for example, uh, PV on top of it, then you add more uncertainty to your system. So basically our IP or what we develop, it's uh, I would call it uh, distributed energy resources operation system. It is very capable with specific in uh, SOFC in mind. So it's not gas turbines, it's specific our own uh, SOFC, and we are using off-the-shelf uh, SOFC stacks uh, with our addition. So we add uh, IoT sensors, and we had some other uh, mechanisms, wiring, wiring, the new wiring, and so forth, in order to be able to uh, provide the load variation, uh, which doesn't exist today. I mean, none of the SOFC manufacturers are dealing with uh, load variation, so it's constant uh, rate. Got it. Natalie, thanks for that. I think my question is all around where you see the target markets for this. Uh, bearing in mind, you know, the building, the real estate space is large, complicated. 
multifaceted. So how, where do you see yourself in, say, a year's time, five years' time, 10 years' time in terms of the markets you're serving, size of building, geographies, mm-hmm. et cetera? I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, my previous company, Smart Green, which was acquired uh, by Teresa Gig Group, so I'm dealing with the energy um, management in commercial building for the past uh, 13 years. So um, my previous company was installed in about 500 buildings in London, in, uh, in Walmart, in the US, in Israel, and so forth. So this is where I came uh, with the idea. Uh, so, I mean, so I'll go to market is to, is to work with, um, uh, with real estate developers. Uh, or facility management companies, okay, which has now, because if, if, if you look at a facility manager or building owner, they have a big problem today because they have to provide a lot of uh, electricity to the customers, which, which they rely on the current grid. And in most cases, you know, if they want to double the electric uh, capacity and they won't, the answer in 90% of the cases is no, this is number one, especially if you want to add fast charger. Uh, and of course, they have to deal with lots of um, uh, resiliency issues. So in your time, our roadmap, so within, within the next 12 months, we're going to install one or two systems in the US with a specific um, real estate developer. In two years, uh, let's say in about two years time, probably we install 10 to 20 systems. In about three years time, uh, we have an ambition to open our own uh, factory for fuel cell. So we are talking with uh, two fuel cell company to license their technology and to open our own factory in the US and Europe. Uh, just because of supply chain issues. I mean, um, now everybody are looking for SOFC, for electrolyzers. Um, so, there, there, I mean, and if we want 1,000 buildings would require us, we'll have to, to generate about 50 megawatts of capacity. Uh, and today's full SOFC capacity, maybe it's one gig. So if you want to make sure that we have enough supply, we'll have to build uh, our own factory or production line for SOFC stocks and SOFC systems uh, within the next. So to answer your question, within a year or two, within a year, we'll have a working uh, better site in the US. Within two years, we'll have a commercial, the first 10, 20 commercial systems. And in 2026 onward, we think of having like uh, 100, 200, 300 buildings every year. I mean, just to bear in mind, 1,000 buildings, is equal to about um, fifty million dollars of uh, profit, not revenues, uh, based on five cents per one kilowatt, and this is achievable. I mean, if you look at uh, micro turbine companies like uh, Capstone, they are doing today uh, one thousand turbines um, every year, and there are about two hundred people companies. So it's you don't need to be huge to make one thousand, two thousand buildings um, per year. Well, so this is energy as a service. If once you are you have the one thousand buildings, the next year you have two thousand because it's one thousand plus another one thousand, so forth. So that's the idea. So by two thousand thirty, our business model, we'd like to see our systems installed in about fifteen thousand uh, buildings, which are not. I mean, it sounds much, but as, as, as I mentioned, if you saw in the slides, there are six million commercial buildings in the US alone. So having fifteen thousand uh, or twenty thousand buildings, it's about one two three percent of the market. Okay, thank you. I think there's a bit more for me to just digest there to get my head around it and the complexities therein. So let me just sit with that for a second. One question I have for you, Nadi, is what is the status of the team and how do you plan to scale this up quickly? You're clearly very technical, but I feel like selling into this market being very technical will make things a little challenging. Correct. So currently, I mean, we are four, um, four founders two professors from Tel Aviv University and bar University, uh, fuel cell uh, guys, myself, I'm more on the system level, uh, and there's two persons on the chemical level and on the uh, mechanical engineering. We have we have um, outsourcing uh, the software, uh, as again, and so for the next 12 months, we'll, we'll keep the team six to eight, 10 people maximum, uh, because we have we have a very specific task of delivering the first sixty kilowatt unit uh, to the customer, okay, to the probably the US, and we use of course outsourcing companies. So the fuel stacks um, and the system is built by third parties, two or three different th- third parties. So of course, once we grow the uh, business, 
we have to hire more um, salespeople. Uh, and the business model, of course, I mean, the installation will be done with distributor. So we don't intend to, in, to um, install the system ourselves. So for example, we already have an access. We just approached, uh, for example, a micro turbine company, a few of them in the US. So we have a list of 400 qualified companies uh, that have installed CHP solutions in commercial buildings. So the idea is to move with these companies um, and to install the equipment. Uh, in the property in every region. Understood, understood. I would I would um, cut things off here so that we have enough time for our last company of the night since things are starting to get a little late. But Nadi, thanks so much for presenting. Um, it's, a, it's a super interesting company. Clearly, uh, I it's a little, parts of it are over my head. I can admit that. I That's part of the benefit of running a syndicate is we have the smartest people in our group and bring in the others that we need for uh, diligence and diving deeper. This is one I might need to dive a little bit deeper into though. And then our last company of the night, farming. Farming's messed up. And what's even harder, funding farming and transitioning to sustainable farming. I want to hand things over to John now with Heavy Finance. I don't remember how we got connected, but they are helping farmers switch to more sustainable farming habits and practices, which apparently can be a pretty big deal, even just if you're able to get them to uh, stop tilling. John, do you want to take things away and tell us about heavy finance and how you're uh, how you're getting heavy? Absolutely, Matt. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on. I'm just going to start with a prelude to heavy finances story and then switch right over to um, the actual pitch. I used to work on the other side. I used to work on, uh, well, I used to work for a bank that invests exclusively in fintechs and marketplace lenders in Europe. And before that, I was working as a placement agent connecting uh, the tier one investment banks with the larger marketplace lenders that had already exceeded that 100 million euro loan book uh, barrier that, 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 that needs to uh, be overcome the, the hurdle. Uh, and then when the war in Ukraine started, uh, I live in Germany, and one of the things that I noticed was that you couldn't get cooking oil in uh, the supermarkets. And, and when you dig into it, when you dig into the supply chain, I think one of your speakers earlier was uh, speaking about that uh, with, with the supply chain disruptions. Uh, but over a quarter of Europe's food uh, was coming from, well, especially grain was coming from uh, Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia, and fertilizers also. So what happened was uh, we understood that Europe's food security is uh, in, in a very perilous uh, place. So I switched over to heavy finance. I actually had found them two years ago. Can you see, can you see my screen? Is it on full screen right now? Right now, we've just got you. Thousand pardons. Let me let me share my screen. No worries, no worries. I can add a little bit of extra time on there for you. We may be a fintech, but I am an old man when it comes to technology. So I'm just no worries. You had to go last, so we'll give you some benefits at least. For anyone who's not familiar, after this, we'll go to the startup of the night and uh, decide who wins uh, the ultimate honor. Will it be John? Take it away, John. I will. Apologies. I'm having a hard time uh, sharing my screen, but let me just tell you the story. Um, the I am is shareable. We have a professional data room and a full uh, investment memorandum uh, for anybody that's interested to review it. Ultimately, uh, coming back to the story, Heavy Finance aims to reduce one gigaton of uh, CO2 emissions by 2050. Uh, when I joined them, uh, I switched over from the investment banking side because I wanted to help uh, these phenomenal people uh, raise capital. They had already uh, seen some great traction since their inception two years ago. They uh, were founded in the midst of, of, of the corona crisis, and since then they've already originated We've already originated 25 million euros in agriculture loans, 40% of which are have already gone towards sustainable farming. Uh, and the loan book has performed 
extremely well, uh, low LTVs, very decent IRRs to investors. And in current times, it is a perfect uh, addition to a defensive portfolio because the security packages uh, offer an inflation hedge uh, opportunity. They're raising, they're rising in, in value, heavy machinery, crops, uh, farmland. Uh, we're originating in five countries in the EU. Uh, we're currently headquartered in, in, in Lithuania, but we are moving it to Dublin because uh, we're launching a dark green fund, an Article 9 compliant uh, fund that will allow LPs to co-invest alongside the European Investment Fund, who, who takes on half of the um, position into the fund uh, to finance sustainable agriculture um, across the five countries that we're originating. And I wish I uh, could have updated my computer settings. I had plenty of time uh, to show you some of these um, images. What we're really addressing is a 30 billion euro funding gap in Europe, where on one hand, you have banks who due to RWA requirements and the general costs that, that they have to pass down to uh, the borrowers, are in a position where it's not profitable for them to originate loans that are less than 50,000 euros. At the same time, you have 93% uh, of European farmers who own less than 50 hectares of arable land. So this has a very large segment of the European uh, farming community who don't have access to uh, well, cheap capital or any capital for that matter. So we are looking to to capture less than 2% of this market. Uh, the total available market is 230 billion euros in Europe. And we're looking to have a loan book of 4 billion euros by 2030. Uh, the, the purposes of loans are varied, but again, the largest segment of our, our, our loan book goes towards no-till farming and other uh, farming methods that preserve biodiversity and reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. This includes switching over to different kinds of fertilizers uh, uh, and buying new equipment that, that, that uh, in instead of tractors that do uh, tilling, they do no till. Uh, so far, we've supported over 750 farmers, and the average loan size is about 33,000 uh, euros, and the average term is 29 months. Uh, 30 we seconds. We're launching into five additional markets in the e in the EU. Uh, we've become cash flow positive. Uh, we've raised an additional three million just last week uh, from an existing VC, uh, and we have a pretty great competitive advantage over other marketplaces in in Europe who either focus exclusively as a white label or uh, or focus on the developing world, uh, thus making it uh, not that interesting for institutional investors of Europe, unfortunately. Uh, and we're offering a very uh, attractive uh, risk return profile right now, given current fears of an extended period of deleveraging. We also have a separate carbon farming project where investors can share the proceeds of the sale of carbon credits uh, together with the farmer and with heavy finance. Uh, ESG is at the heart of, of heavy finances uh, investment activities. So if you are interested, uh, reach out and I'll be happy to share an IM and a data room with you. A thousand pardons for, for my computer. No oh. worries. It happens. It happens. I like to say technology is great, except when it sucks. Let's bring the other investors in to, to tear this one apart and see what they think about heavy finance. Brian, um, and Jake, I'm going to pull you guys back in there, pull myself back in as well. My quick question while I'm getting everyone back on board would be why or how or how do you see yourself competing against folks like Indie Ag, Indigo Ag and other players in the ag lending space? Well, um, Indigo is a, uh, they don't only focus on, uh, on, 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 well, they're, they're more of a seed uh, revolutionizing company, if you will. We, we use quite a bit of the materials that they uh, develop when it comes to um, uh, carbon sequestration and measuring soil. We don't see them as a competitor. First of all, we focus exclusively in, in Europe and they're an American company. Uh, 
Uh, second of all, uh, we see them as a complementary company to what we're doing. When you look at Europe itself, and this was on the on, on one of my slides, if, I mean, you, you have Tarfin, you have AgroCredit, you have AgriFi. European fintechs, you have several hundred buy now, pay later products, half of which are probably going to go bankrupt uh, over this coming period. Whereas you have only a handful of uh, lenders that are agri doing agriculture loans that are doing ESG focused agriculture loans and that are offering both a marketplace as well as a solution for institutional investors. We're completely capable of doing a securitization deal with an investment bank. We're completely, uh, well, we're currently focusing on launching this Article 9 compliant uh, fund in, out of Ireland. Uh, so we're, we're, we're quite a bit different from what Indigo does. Uh, we're still primarily a, a, an ag tech that focuses on lending, whereas they have uh, other things that they focus on. I think in one of your emails, Matt, you asked how we're different from AgriFi. And if you look at most institutions now based out of London, uh, the investment banks, pension funds, insurance funds, uh, they won't even look east of Poland right now uh, when it comes to investing into debt. Uh, so we're focusing on uh, European markets where you can collect quite a lot of data where you have security packages that can be independently verified, audited, monitored, and uh, the farmers can be held uh, to account. 80% of our portfolio, not only 100% of our portfolio is backed by security packages, but 80% are also backed by personal guarantees of the farmers. Uh, and that a, a personal guarantee from a, a borrower in Western Europe is, is, is different than when you have something from the developing world. Um, John, um, just to jump in here. So I'm a bit familiar with, with this space. Um, being part of a large institution, Aegon Asset Management, we have a multi-billion dollar. Uh, By the way, Brian, even you pronounce it incorrectly. The, the people in, in, the, in the Netherlands uh, pronounce it Aegon. Yeah, I know. That's right. That's right. I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to try and spit on, spit on my screen by trying to do that. Um, <laughs> The, uh, so the, the question I have on that, because we have, in, it's in the U.S., a large ag lending business. Um, how do you, uh, I mean, how, how are you set up? Can you walk me through your origination process? Because it takes a considerable amount of manpower, boots on the ground, those type of things, especially in um getting across and having relationships with farmers themselves to look on take on funding and there's an education process and there's, there's a lot of things and it takes, um, yeah, there, there's a lot of different elements. How, how, how do you get to, um, I don't, I don't have the number in front of me, but you, you know, you said to a billion in, um, in originations, like, can you walk through that a little bit? Sure, Brian. Actually, this was a question that was asked by one of the U.S. asset managers that we were talking to a couple of months ago. Um, we've put together a very detailed data room that that, that answers all of these questions in, in detail. Happy to share that with you by email after this call. Uh, but in short, uh, a large chunk of the decision making of, of, of heavy finance is already automated. Now, there are areas where we need to have a manual input, and, and this is mostly uh, related to compliance, KYC, making sure that the farmer is real, making sure that the assets are real and that they're not pledged to other financial institutions so that we have a first lien uh, claim on the assets. Uh, we are also, uh, in terms of our origination capacity, right now we're originating 2 million euros worth of loans every month. Our current capacity in the markets that we uh, are operating in right now is 10 million euros per month in, in, in origination. And this is not including new European markets that we want to expand into, um, like Spain and, 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 and Hungary and Romania. Uh, so if we are able to um, onboard institutions that can provide us a warehouse facility or that will invest into this, into this fund, uh, then we can actually start matching the demand that we have from credit worthy farmers that have uh, excellent uh, supply chains who sell their crop immediately 80% of our borrowers are grain uh, producers and 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 their crops get bought uh, the moment that they're on the market uh, this isn't um I mean, I mean, we've been asked whether we'll take the crop as collateral it's something that we can do 
but not something that we necessarily want to do. We do want to empower our farmers. And uh, there have been moments out of 850 loans that we've originated, there were cases where six farmers asked for uh, an extension on, 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 on the principal repayment. And we provide that. We, we, we do see ourselves as a, a friend to our, our borrowers. And usually they come complaining to us about local banks that so we're only happy to um, take their business. But in terms of uh, actual document to, uh, documented capacity to ramp up our uh, originating capacity, this has been uh, very well documented based off of our existing um, loan book our, and, and its growth. So we can easily reach, well, we're anticipating a loan book of 177 million euros by the end of next year. If, if we don't even uh, uh, sign an institution. If we sign an institution, then we can start originating many more loans and expanding into new markets. I guess just to, just to add on to that, part of, part of my question was really just on, on the pure origination, on identifying the farmer, mm. getting them to come on board, not the documentation process, and those things could be automated. Um, it sounds like the, there's a marketplace and uh, other things there. Is that an, one of the entry points on getting someone to take on a loan via some interface versus, you know, literally going and having an individual go to a farm, talk to them about what you guys can offer, you know, handshake on a deal to then bring it back. There have been some some interesting things that 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 we've observed over the past two years of origination. First of all, uh, the, the stereotype that people have about farmers that they're not very tech savvy uh, appears to be incorrect. Uh, a, a very large chunk of our farmers came through Facebook ads that we put out, um, and uh, the conversion of those uh, uh, of those borrowers was uh, pretty um, interesting to see um, the statistics behind it. Um, a lot of uh, our borrower base also comes from word of mouth. Uh, a farmer talks to his friend uh, and recommends heavy finance. There are a lot of walk-ins, people who just apply through our website. And uh, the sad truth is currently we're rejecting 94% of loan applications that we receive. So there are more than enough farmers in Europe that we could be serving, that we could be helping uh, but we only have a retail investor base of about 5,000 people right now and a couple of institutions that are financing us. We're still a young company, uh, but uh, I think, and we've only been targeting institutional capital since July. Um, and, and that's why we decided to launch this fund. Uh, we're inviting institutions right now to, 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 to make pledges uh, to enter as LPs into this fund. Uh, the, the, the minimum size of the, of the fund will be 30 million. And we're looking to launch it um, March 2023, uh, but the target size will, will actually be uh, 50 million. So happy to have a follow up call with you on that. And in terms of why you could fail, what's the biggest risk that you see in the business now? You've you've oh. you've reached you've reached cash flow. You've got some funding. What could happen? What could derail you? What scares me the most right now is that in uh, my efforts talking to institutions, oftentimes you have people who don't even want to talk to you without looking at the asset class. Uh, so if we can't uh, secure a sizable institutional commitment, and we continue to reject. Uh, applications from really good farmers, uh, then the business would be dead and we would have failed. And in terms of the business of the future, the business of the future in your mind is really the, the fund and with the marketplace being a secondary model? No, no. Um, we're going to stay true to the people that brought us to where we're at right now. It's the retail investors to whom we're eternally grateful for getting us to where we are. We are a profitable company, thanks to uh, the loyal retail investor base. I sometimes call them up. Um, the, the largest chunk of our retail investors are here in Germany. Uh, just chat to them, see what their uh, feedback is. The future of the company is really carbon farming and sustainability. 
uh, were a first mover in the Baltics and to, to a large extent in many parts of uh, Northern Europe with respect to uh, helping farmers switch to no-till farming. Uh, and then a, a, a process that goes through VERA in the US where uh, carbon credits are granted uh, against uh, measured results and, and not uh, predictions, not estimations, but actual measurement in terms of carbon sequestration. Uh, and then the proceeds of the sale of, of carbon credits are shared between the investor, the, the borrower, and a very small uh, piece of it goes to heavy finance. Uh, of this fund that I mentioned earlier, 70% of the expected portfolio is going to be exclusively uh, sustainability-focused loans, uh, environmental and sustainability. And, 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 and uh, uh, the other benefits will be you know, supporting small farmers, SMEs. Uh, the, we're not talking about large conglomerates. We're talking about you know, cheese producers, wine producers, uh, grain producers that, that that have small hectares of land and have a, a pretty good supply chain and um, have been profitable for the past five years. Very cool. Very cool. I think it's super meaningful. And uh, a ton of carbon per, per hectare is not a, not a bad, not shabby at all. I, um, I would certainly have more questions. I'm sure everyone has more questions probably for most of the startups here, but we're also starting to to get a little late, I want to make sure we've got time for everybody to crown a startup of the night and get a little bit of bragging out there. So, John, thanks so much for coming on for presenting what you guys are doing at Heavy Finance. And now I want to I want to turn things over to my other awesome investor panelists. So, Brian, Jake, and I. Now it is our job, our duty to choose a startup of the night. Who are you most interested in? Which one or two companies would you want to set up meetings with, or would think about investing, or see the biggest upside for? Who's got you the most excited, and why? This time, Brian, you go go first. I just didn't realize you get put on the spot here. I, I thought we were going to a dark room together to to deliberate on on these type of things. Dun, dun, dun. I can play the Jeopardy music if that helps. <laughs> do 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 do. You know, um, it's it's interesting. There's a very it, it's it's very challenging to really without digging into any of these companies to understand where you know the the potential greatest opportunity is from an investment standpoint. Um, they serve a lot of different markets. Really, everyone did a fantastic job today, um, by the way, to articulate. I know it's incredibly challenging to go over your whole business in five minutes that you pour, pour your lifeblood into. Um, and hopefully our, our questions were, were good and educated enough uh, and engaging. Um, you know, it, there's, there's some interesting things that were unpacked here today. Um, quite honestly, I, I, I thought there's in, there's really something that I'd like to pull a thread more, just understand a potential opportunity, um, set on NICOA, I thought was really, really interesting on the sense of the sustainability on what is being augmented for things around, you know, uh, plastic usage in the ocean to different types of chemical bases, um, and, and really disrupting again this is all surface level stuff at, at this point from from having these conversations but i would say that that was one are we doing selecting a couple here or what you, could, you could pick one or two and then we can see kind of where the overlaps are um gotcha and then um well i guess let's let's pass it off to you guys and then if we come back for Okay. I think Jake said he has to jump soon. So Jake, you're up. Who are your favorites and why? So I I think in terms of a sector I know best, um, that is going to be pipe predict, just in terms of, you know, there's a huge problem. You see challenges around droughts around the world. So helping utilities to better manage those scarce resources, I can see having a, a huge impact from a sustainability point of view. Uh, from a, yeah, an intrigue, it's Nyoka is the one I'm most intrigued by as well, but I think that's just because I want to get my head around the space and the novelty of that. 
and I'm certainly interested to dig into what is the impact there because it's certainly novel, but is that kind of dollar for dollar going to have the greatest sustainability impact? But then in terms of traction, I think Myra, I think looks like they've done some incredible work or some great traction and distribution for an early stage. So I'm sorry, I've given you three rather than one, but if I had to be put on the spot for one, I'd probably go Nyoka. Yeah, and I would add just the other one that I find really intriguing because I spent a lot of I I spent a lot of time in the built environment and electrification and grid edge. Fonto sounds quite interesting. I need to unpack more about um, the behind the meter solution for the um, the type of fuel cell uh, application, but I think it's it's quite interesting for grid resiliency. but I'll leave it at that. And then I think from my side, I was a big fan of, still not sure how to pronounce it, Nyoka or Nyoka. I think they're doing incredibly cool stuff. The biggest questions I hear there is the market size and if they'd be able to transition into those other uh, more tangential or um, different sectors. If they can, then it's a, it's a gold mine. I like Pipe Predict as well. I initially pushed back a little when Alex at Uber Morgan introduced them and said, is this really a climate company? And I found out 50% of the water is basically getting wasted. There's quite a there's quite a bit when it comes to reducing the waste there on the energy and uh, water resource scarcity um, impact, which is going to be a bigger and bigger problem. And then I think um, the third company I would probably want to highlight, uh, Miro, because of what it can do getting influencers and athletes on board to promote more sustainable practices. Consumers are what drives change and we need to make less consuming cool. And the fact that they've been able to get Serena, Carmelo, um, I don't know if I can say Alex Morgan, I can say it. He can't say it maybe, but uh, incredible athletes on board with this is pretty, it's pretty, uh, pretty groundbreaking and would love to see how that changes. But I think those would be my three. And then overlap wise, it looks like Nyoko or Pipe Predict. Do we want to choose one or do we want co champs? Comes down to you, I think, Brian. Oh, it comes it comes down to me. Yeah, since you picked well, one. I mean, I I, I co champs then. I mean co champs, okay. Yeah. Well, they go well together. One lights the water and one saves the water. So Nyoka, Pipe Predict, congratulations for winning today's session of the startup tank that's not to say the other companies presenting aren't awesome as well you guys are that's the that's the nature of being on the show we get a lot of applications now uh if you guys are interested in applying the startup tank.com for more details and this has all been brought to you guys by um, carta and valbon so we use them for spvs we're working on doing a deal now and i'm sure a lot of you are as investors as well or maybe you're a startup and need to raise money and want to set up a syndicate Carta is a great way to do it. Or maybe you've got a cap table and need to manage it. Or maybe you have to manage employee options. Or maybe you're just in this space at all because Carta pretty much does absolutely everything in the venture and startup space. Check them out at forward.vc slash Carta, that's C-A-R-T-A, and sell them that uh, the Startup Tank sent you so they know to keep supporting us. And Brian, Jake, where's the best place for people to find you so that we can go grab dinner? Oh, look, uh, I'm in. I'm in Los Angeles. And uh, Jake, where where are you? Uh, I'm currently on the East Coast, but move of the US, but moving to Austin in about a month. Ah, that reference so doesn't land between. at all. Yeah, that reference doesn't yeah. land. Since you guys are you guys are both in the states, you're not hungry for dinner. I'm hungry for dinner. <laughs> I meant where to find you. I meant where to find you online. So, uh, yeah, Aegean Asset <laughs> Management and Vela Capital, right? Yeah, so um, you can reach me at jake at valacap.com or on LinkedIn. Yeah, if you, you can spell you reach on LinkedIn. Mine is uh, bwayne at agonam.com. Feel free to reach out. And folks, you can find me at forward.vc, the number four ward.vc. We invest in companies that move the world forward. If you find that interesting, if you find these type of companies that change the world and yet actually make money doing it, pretty, uh, pretty inspiring. You want to learn more about our credit investor syndicate, no solicitation, but we would love for you to come over and say hi, forward.vc slash syndicate. And this is the Startup Tank. You want to apply the startuptank.com, go support Carta, go grab some food, go change the world. Thank you everybody for coming on. 
And until next time, cheers. And hit the subscribe bell. If you haven't subscribed on YouTube or wherever you are, shame on you. Subscribe, subscribe on the podcast, et cetera. Help us reach more climate companies and get more exposure for these awesome companies. Cheers. Great job, Matt.